மாலை வணக்கம் வணக்கம் ஆனரபிள் மிஸ்டர் நாராயணசாமி சீஃப் மினிஸ்டர் ஆஃப் பாண்டிச்சேரி ஆனரபிள் மிஸ்டர் பிரவீன் காட்ரன் நேஷனல் மினிஸ்டர் ஆஃப் பப்ளிக் என்டர்பிரைசஸ் கவர்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் சவுத் ஆப்பிரிக்கா ஆனரபிள் டாக்டர் மோசஸ் வீராசாமி நாகமுத்து ஃபார்மர் பிரைம் மினிஸ்டர் கயான ஆனரபிள் டாக்டர் நபி பிள்ளை ஃபார்மர் ஹை கமிஷனர் ஆஃப் யுனைடட் நேஷன்ஸ் ஆஃப் யுனைடட் நேஷன்ஸ் ஹை கமிஷன் ஆஃப் ஹியூமன் ரைட்ஸ் ஆனரபிள் மிஸ் கூட்ரன் ஃப்ரம் ஆஸ்திரியா ஆனரபிள் Mr. Nasser Al Nasser from United Nations former uh, chairman of the General Assembly Honorable Dr. Kanda M. Kala former Under Secretary General of United Nations Honorable Mr. Ravi Pillai Minister for Finance Province of Nepal South Africa honorable justice durai karunagaran former chief justice of supreme court of sea shells honorable mr trichy siva member of parliament from chennai honorable mr tk silangovan member of parliament from chennai mr n ram chairman hind group of companies the hindu newspaper mr dr r sitaraman chief executive officer doga bank qatar mr lorry ferguson former member of parliament australia mr mek magaraj former minister from south africa mr logi naidu former deputy mayor former deputy mayor from uh, durban south africa esteemed guests distinguished speakers respected representatives of ngo international organizations and dear global participants on behalf of bidras development society i welcome you all all with a profound sense of happiness to the nelson mandela centenary international conference on peace and conflict resolution and also on the launch of initiative towards installing the statue for nelson mandela in chennai we are instituting an annual award in the name of national mandela international award for conflict resolution to all the peace work workers peace keeping personalities peace institution and conflict resolution educational institution peace is a key determinant of growth development and prosperity durable peace in pockets of conflict affected countries and regions stem from conflict resolution facilitated by international organizations institutions ngos and individuals among the individuals who played a key role in formulating implementing and monitoring peace resolution uh, peace resolution uh, played mr nelson mandela stands as a distinctly different champion of peace as a root cause of conflict is often the lack of sustainable source of livelihood international organization and the ngo play a key role in implementing projects which create sustainable source of wealth creation with the aid of generous multilateral and bilateral donations as a fundamental prerequisite of durable peace apart from compelling economic reasons the main reason 
arises on conflicts countries and continents due largely to ethnic identity crises cultural crises and language issues intervention by international organization and ngos to address this cause of conflict do not constitute an act of charity but you want justice to make community live in harmony you must know the conflict is going on in those sri lankan conflict tamils and sri lankans conflict going on in india pakistan conflict going on in india china syria in the cyprus between uh, uh, um, turkey and uh, greece south sudan like many other places conflict still going on the purpose of today's conference is to honor the stakeholders of justice peace and conflict resolution and to uh, glorify the great hero who sacrificed his entire life for the cause of revealing people from the clutches of suppression and the promoting peace as he evidenced by the 1993 nobel prize that he won for his work for the peaceful termination of the apartheid regime and for laying the foundations laying the foundation of the new democratic south africa nelson mandela told i won't allow for black domination i won't allow for the white domination i won't allow for any domination all are equal in my government all are equal in my country like that he served as a voice of the voiceless and woke for the hopeless the participation of the i level ministers chief minister uh, former prime minister diplomats uh, member of parliament leading journalists bankers leading opinion makers at today's conference speaks volume of the respect nelson mandela continues to command his wisdom was a blessing to the depressed oppressed and suppressed his explicit smile was a great source of delight to the entire world his attitude towards right and wrong was a model of personal and professional excellence for leaders who use it in good governance under pinned by a high degree of transparency and accountability he demonstrated his superhuman personality to foster the ideological conviction by dint of total dedication you won the support of all who stood for all that was good for the marginalized segments of the society his commitment for the poor stemmed from the fact that he took uh, politics as a vocation all through while welcoming you all to the conference i welcoming your continued support to all that is needed to the grand insulation of the statue of nelson mandela in greater chennai and for the award insulation as a mark of respect for his contribution to the indian community in south africa in general and to the tamil community in particular your esteemed presence on the occasion of installing the nelson mandela statue and also the one day conference between durban south africa and tamil nadu will certainly add to the grandeur of the great event after purana despite the huge presence of the tamil community in south africa the community it is yet to make major stake in political and governmental position positions in including ministerial positions i am sure soon our aspirations will soon see the 
light of reality. I hope the ideas that emerged during the conference all motivate Tamils living in South Africa to play a more active role in South African politics and public affairs and social lifestyle. Peace and conflict resolution was introduced as a higher learning subject in various institutions and universities around the world. Thus, it is resulted in creating several peacemakers, peace educators, peace academicians, peace uh, loving NGOs to work in the field. In continuation with this, judicial institutions all over the world and also in India, such a district court, high court, and supreme court uh, created a arbitration center, mediation center, conflict resolution centers, family courts to resolve the conflict among the individuals, families, companies, communities, and the center and state relations, and the regions and regional, regional groups, and the caste creed and everything. In the fitness of things, we are planning to organize international conference on peace and conflict resolution annually to create awareness and go further for peace to, and conflict resolution to bring world peace. I am overwhelmed by the cheerful readiness of all the participants to support uh, the purpose of today's event. I all heartedly welcome you all is all to this conference. The Madras Development Society doing this wonderful service from 1981 to till date. We used to organize conferences, seminars, and uh, workshops on various uh, subjects to, to create awareness and uh, create a goodwill among the society, in the society. Madras Development Society created a World Tumble Economic Foundation and organizing World Tumble Economic Conference every year. In 2017, we organized the fourth international conference in Durban city. We got a wonderful local support. We organized the very grand manner and the King of Zulu and inaugurated the conference. And we are very happy to organize this international conference in the name of Nelson Mandela to show our uh, thanksgiving to for the Tamil community helped in every step in South Africa. I'm welcoming one and all for this beautiful and wonderful uh, get together in the, through the Zoom meeting. I'm very happy to welcome all over the world, the, all the ministers and everyone, all the participants participated in this meeting. I'm very happy welcoming one and all. Thank you. Now, I request the Honorable Chief Minister of uh, Pondicherry, our strong supporter, our patron, he only helped us to organize a conference in, in Pondicherry in 2008-18. He told, be very much happy about this conference and he given a wonderful certificate for us. He is with us. He is present over our conference and also he is unveiling the portrait of uh, Mr. Bharat Ratna, Nobel, Nobel Prize one where uh, Nelson Mandela uh, portrait now. Sir, you can unveil your, the photograph of Nelson Mandela. Thank you. Sir, uh, sir, unmute CM office. Okay. Please unmute. Yeah. I have unveiled the, the portrait of uh, the Dr. Nelson Mandela. Uh, I am very happy. Sir, ah, I am very happy 
that our good friend okay. the chairman of the president of the madras development society dr sampat has organized this international conference on peace and conflict resolution in the name of sir same sir the yeah. faisla kek yeah. matte mike yeah 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 Yes, I am. I am. I am on. I am on line. Huh? Yes, yes, yes. We are hearing. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am very happy, Dr. V R S Sampat, the president of Metal Development Society. Sir, your speech is not. No, no. He it is audible. Not here by us. Sir, it is. Okay, it is. Sir, we are listening. We are. We are all listening, no. Sampat. No. Sampat, no. audible. Audible. Yes, he is very audible. Like as far as way is Gaya. Okay, Nelson Mandela on his centenary, and the participants. I would like to thank them on this occasion. The inaugural address is going to be by Honorable Mr. Pradeep Gordon. Eh? National. National Minister of Public Enterprises, Government of South Africa. Yes, I got it. Council of the National Mandela International Award for Conflict Resolution by Honorable Dr. His Excellency Moses Hira Sami Nagamotu, former Prime Minister of Guyana. Individual award is pre presented to. Dr. Navi Pillai, former High Commissioner of UN Human Rights Commission. The Insusha Award is Austrian Society Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, Austria. Dr. G. Iswanathan, Honorable Vice Chancellor of VIT University, he is going to launch Nelson Mandela. Statue project in Chennai. The other dignitaries who are going to address on the occasion, Honorable Mr. Nazar Al Nazar, former Chairman, UN General Assembly, Qatar. Honorable Dr. Kande Yomkela, former Under Secretary. General of UN, Member of Parliament, Sir Leon, Honourable Mr. Ravi Pillai, Minister of Finland, Finance, South South Africa, Honourable Justice Dorai Karnakaran, Honourable Chief Justice, Supreme Court, Cecilis, Honourable Member of Parliament, my very good friend, Sir Kriti Siva. Honorable C. N. N. Ram, Chairman Hindu Group of Companies, the Hindu, Dr. R. Sita Raman, CEO, Goa Bank, Qatar, Honorable Farmer, Member of Parliament, Asia, Mr. Lori Ferguson, Honorable Member of Parliament, my another good friend, C. T. K. S. Elangogan. The concluding remark will be by. Mr. Mac Maharaj, former yes. minister and fellow, Ribbon Island, prisoner with Nelson Mandela, South yes. Africa. Yes. And what are thanks is going to be by Mr. Logi Naidu, former deputy mayor of Durban. I'm very happy, Mr. Sambat, has explained the purpose of this meet, and also yes, elaborately explained. how this peace and conflict resolution is going to be the order of the day there is conflict all over the world where are you the tension is mounting even in our country in asian region india and pakistan it is a never ending conflict now china the dispute and the border is escalating every day today it has become tension for our country and apart from that 
several disputes between United States and China, United States and other countries, and the even in the Arabian nations, lot of the conflicts are going on, and the when it was imagined, visualized that there should be world peace, but on the contrary, the conflict between countries are increasing day by day. Now we remember the father of the nation, Sri Mahatma Gandhi. Now we are celebrating 150th year, 50th year of Mahatma Gandhi's centenary. In fact, I am a member of the National Council, which is headed by the Honorable Prime Minister. We are doing a lot of work to propagate the ideals of Mahatma Gandhi to the people of the world. We found, because the urge for freedom, which Mahatma Gandhi got was from South Africa. The, the people out the whites have taken away the rights of the, the local native, the African people. Even for moving from one district to the other, they have to get a pass. They have no land right. They cannot have equal right. That created the urge in the mind of Mahatma Gandhi. The same is the situation in India. And our country has been suppressed by the British rule, colonial rule. Our people get freedom. Therefore, Gandhiji started the freedom movement after reading the situation that has been prevailing in South Africa and ultimately he succeeded. There are two kinds of the approach for the purpose of getting freedom. The approach of Mahatma Gandhi was peace, dialogue and the, the agitation is by way of Satyagraha, non-cooperation and Sudeshi movement. But in South Africa, the Nelson Mandela, he took a different route. He became the president of the African National Congress. He has taken the lead in organizing the army against the rulers. He was put in prison. Nelson Mandela was the only person who had been in long period in jail. And he, he was he, and the, in the last leg of his life, he fought for peace and harmony all over the world. Therefore, he, 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 has, he has become a noble laureate and he was given the Bharat Ratana by our government. And even the people of the world remember him today because of the sacrifice which has been rendered by him for freedom of South Africa. Like our, our people remember Mahatma Gandhi for his sacrifice for the purpose of getting freedom in, in our country. And by, by this conference, definitely the initiative that has been taken by Dr. Sampath all the important the functionaries from all walks of life who are here, as the person who has been presiding over, it is my bounden duty to welcome you all. And I would like to hear your views about the state of affairs prevailing in the world arena and also in our country. Because in the, our, our the discussion will not be complete if you don't discuss what is happening in India also today. Because the border tension, because India has, not, has been very friendly in the earlier days with neighboring countries, whether it is Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, then Pakistan to a certain extent, China, all these countries. But the, there is the conflict has started 
in the neighboring countries nepal is not very friendly with us today take the case of bangladesh friction between india and bangladesh then china the border tension is continuing even today china is claiming the arunachal pradesh is their territory i would like to share my experience as a minister in government of india when i was the minister of personnel in prime minister's office in government of india when dr manmohan singh honorable former prime minister of india was in office i toured that area in my two capacities as the minister in government of india and prime minister's office and also as a general secretary of the indian national congress i went and addressed several meetings i went to all the northeastern states in fact especially in arunachal arunachal pradesh i went to the border of china and address meeting as a as a government official in fact in tawang the honorable former finance minister sri chidambaram was also with me we both address a meeting of the local population there suddenly when we were touring there was uh, the objection there was a statement issued by the chinese government that the indian ministers are touring our territory it is very unfortunate with that we have got a elected government in uh, arunachal pradesh our honorable members of parliament from indian parliament are representing from there and china is still claiming that arunachal is part of that territory and in the border tension which has been prevailing everybody knows therefore to bring an end to bring a resolution it is only through dialogue we can achieve it because on both sides there should not be the use of the language by the diplomats by the political executives should be in one line because when when the by the honorable minister sri rajnath singh goes to moscow we had a meeting with his own counterpart of china the day he is we boarded the flight there is a statement from chinese government saying that the india should not claim even one inch of land from china this kind of hard statements are coming we are all patriots we respect the other nations but we will not give up our rights to land at any cost we are prepared to sacrifice our life for the nation that is the that is the inborn quality of an indian so keeping that in mind now therefore the topic that has been taken for debate and discussion today is very important that is international conference on peace and conflict resolution i am very happy that all the important the the leaders from various fields are here i would like to hear their views and in fact the life of nelson mandela will be remembered by the world community for his several the acts and activities which has taken for the purpose of liberating south africa and also ruling the country and thereafter working for world peace and we at that time we remember our father of the nation mahatma gandhi ji for his sacrifice for india's freedom the so keeping that in mind i would like to leave the floor i would like to hear the other leaders i am once again i thank all of you for attending this conference and making the conference a great success thank you very much thank you honorable chief minister you gave a wonderful uh, speech about the nelson mandela as well as the present scenario about the india and the neighboring countries and the conflicts going on around the world i'm very happy i'm requesting for one more things if possible you can also consider to unveil the statue of nelson mandela in pondicherry also 
Uh, Pondicherry, very much the international city. You think over about this request. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, we, we will definitely do it from our government side. We will do it. Thank you. Thank you. I am requesting the Honorable Minister of Pravin Gordon, National Minister for Public Enterprises, uh, Government of South Africa, formally to inaugurate this conference. He is a cabinet minister. He served a long time as a cabinet minister. He's helping a lot for our Indian community. He is a very wonderful minister. I, I, I do not have an opportunity to meet personally, but I heard about him a lot. I am inviting him. Sir, Mr. Pravin, sir. Hello. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon in South Africa and good evening in uh, India. When I want uh, to, to see you... your face, sir. Where? Oh, yes. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Vanakam. <laughs> Vanakam. Vanakam. Yes. Okay. To uh, yourself as a convener of the Madras Development Society. Yes. The Honorable Chief Minister uh, of Pondicherry and all of the distinguished guests in South Africa, we say all protocols observed. And also to my fellow South Africans who uh, I see have joined this uh, conversation as well. Thank you very much for this opportunity and privilege of uh, joining you uh, on this particular, uh, particularly auspicious occasion. Uh, Mr. Mandela, or President Mandela, or Madiba, as we call him in South Africa, is very much part of the DNA, both of our society, our history, and the politics in our country. He embodies uh, the spirit of non-racialism, non-sexism, the values of one humanity, and indeed the values, the universal values contained in the Charter of Human Rights of the United Nations, but also our own human rights in chapter two of our, of our constitution. And it is very appropriate that in moments of crisis, uh, we call upon the thoughts and the kind of leadership that uh, Nelson Mandela and others have offered uh, both South Africa and the world to guide us through these conflictual times uh, that we actually live in. Because the life and teachings of uh, Nelson Mandela have lessons for all of us, wherever we might be in the world and whatever context uh, we find ourselves in. And it's uh, interesting that notwithstanding the impact of the virus uh, COVID-19 on all of us and all our countries, that we are still able to communicate through this form of, of technology. I don't speak as a representative of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, nor the family, but purely as an activist of the African National Congress, the Natal Indian Congress, and the United Democratic Front, all of which have played uh, a very important part in the liberation of this country, uh, in as much as uh, yourselves in India and the solidarity that you've expressed over many decades with the South Africa struggle for human rights have also played an inspirational role. We are all uh, sharing a common legacy of colonialism, oppression, and exploitation in our respective societies, and uh, in that sense have a shared history of resistance uh, to oppression, to discrimination in any form, but also uh, in relation to the various uh, struggles that the Chief Minister pointed to earlier on. But the one set of values that Nelson Mandela and those of us that have grown up in the Sorry, I was muted. Uh, no, 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 it's okay. So the one value which Nelson Mandela and all of us hold very dear is the value of non-racialism and non-sectarianism. It is an important value that can guide us today in many of the conflictual situations that the Chief Minister referred to, but also it has inspired generations of South Africans and freedom fighters elsewhere in the world uh, to fight for the poor, the oppressed, those without employment, and those who have been uh, marginalized in their respective societies. We ourselves in South Africa have been inspired by the struggles of workers from uh, the early 20th century 
the liberation struggles of people like yourselves in India, in China, and in many other parts of the world, including the African continent, and the kind of role that Kwame Nkrumah and others have played on this continent as, as well. And all of us have been uh, informed, as I said, by a common set of principles, uh, which also pervaded uh, the struggles that Martin Luther King and others uh, were part of in, on the American uh, continent uh, today uh, and many years ago. We are, we are continuously committed to the principles of non-racialism, non-sexism, both in the world order, but also in our respective countries and continents, and must be uncompromising in, in pursuit of social justice and true freedoms, the freedom from want of any kind for all of our people, not just for a select few. Having been influenced by many in the world, we in South Africa are active campaigners for peace. We are ac active campaigners on the African continent uh, where our president is the president of the African Union today and for this year to actually silence the guns as we call it here. And it's a phrase that you could borrow uh, on the Asian subcontinent as well because silencing the guns is an important part of protecting hu basic human rights for all citizens in our respective countries and continents as well. It is also the beginning of a process of eliminating poverty, eliminating inequality, and ensuring equal rights for women uh, and other sections of our society. But ladies and gentlemen, today's world is very different from Nelson Mandela's world or Mahatma Gandhi's world or Martin Luther King's world. Today, geopolitics is very complex and uh, there are no longer a, a world that we have in which uh, unipolar politics or bipolar politics uh, is the, co the call of the day. We live increasingly in a world that is developing towards multipolarity in one form or another, and the various border conflicts and other conflicts that we see must be placed within that context. But above all, who pays the price, as many have said throughout history? It is the young men and women of our societies who are sent out to war, who uh, have to impose themselves on uh, millions of people in our respective countries that are involved in conflict and uh, result in the kind of migration that we see and refugees that we see around the world, who today probably total some 200 million people. It is also a world in which geoeconomics is undergoing a transformation. Under the guise of a bipolar world, uh, we have a, the, the conflict between the United States and China uh, for economic supre uh, supremacy, and of course, many other emerging countries as well who are trying to find a place for themselves within a new ge geoeconomic environment. We should also learn from the lessons of history that narrow nationalism is a dangerous phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that can easily whip up the emotions of people and lead to all kinds of xenophobia, which is abused by certain sections of society for their own benefits and does not at the end of the day match the kind of principles that Nelson Mandela and leaders of that caliber stood for, fought for, and lived for. In today's world, and in the real, the real economies of the world, the economies in which real people work, small businesses thrive, and the real lives of people are impacted, you see a difference between that real economy and the financial markets. So it's the financial markets and we, that we've all become used to watching uh, when we want to know the health of an economy. What's the value of the currency? Is the stock market in a particular country rising or falling, and what are the factors that are actually influencing uh, such phenomena. But the financial markets don't necessarily reflect the real economies and the real lives of people and their day-to-day -day struggles to earn a livelihood and uh, thrive, uh, particularly in the context of the pandemic that is affecting us. Today's world and today's countries are also impacted negatively 
by small groups of elites who want to accumulate wealth for themselves and ignore the majority. And that accumulation then leads to greed and corruption. And all our continents, all our countries are impacted by that kind of greed and corruption. And it is, the, again, the poor and the working people of, of our societies who pay the price of accumulation on the one hand amongst a handful of elites and the marginalization of millions of tens of millions, in your case, hundreds of millions of people through the phenomenon of greed and corruption. The destruction of the, of the environment and the impact on climate change as a result of this kind of greed is also that something that the young people of our world is bringing to our notice and saying that apart from the traditional fights uh, and battles that the Nelson, Nelson Mandela generation struggled with, there are new struggles to be fought. There are new frontiers that are opening up for ourselves to commit ourselves to and ensure a better life for the billions of people on, on earth. <coughs> Authors and uh, economists such as uh, Piketty have uh, through their research pointed out how in today's world and today's economy, the rich become richer and the poor either remain the same or the middle class remains the same or in fact declines. And the lives of working class people is uh, resigned to precarious jobs and precarious lives. We've also got to be careful that in the quest to, for, of elites to remain in power and to maintain economic influence, that social fundamentalism of any kind must be discouraged. Race, racism of any kind must be discouraged. That the discrimination and misogyny as far as women are concerned must be discouraged and fought against. <clears throat> it is this spirit that Nelson Mandela would ask us to embrace today. It is this kind of uh, cause of social justice and freedom, the new types of freedom that we need on earth, uh, that Nelson Mandela's generation and Mahatma Gandhi's generation would ask leaders of today and the youth of today to embrace as their passion and their mission in order to save the world and to create a better uh, environment for all of the people of the world and our respective countries as well. As Mr. Mandela pointed out, true reconciliation both within a country and between countries, <coughs> excuse me, does not consist in merely forgetting the past, but rather to learn the lessons of the past and ask ourselves, how does that apply to the future? On the African continent, there are several illustrious examples of the quest for peace and conflict resolution. One such example is that between Ethiopia and Eritrea, which uh, conflict was caught uh, in a stalemate for many, many years. And in the last 18 months to two years, we've seen an important step taken uh, in ensuring that there's peace between the two nations and the normal uh, interactions between the peoples of the two nations as well. But of course, as this distinguished audience knows and many know around the world, and scholars of conflict have advised us that managing protracted social conflict and uh, the kind of conflicts that have been brought to your attention is not a T20 match, a cricket match. It is uh, not one that is over in 20 overs and cricket being the passion of our friends in India and also in South Africa, uh, you would be able to identify with that. Justice is in fact a very complex goal. It requires institutions that are designed to deliberately and uh, determinedly operate in the public interest and for the attainment of the goal of peace and reconciliation amongst people. And perhaps one of the greatest dangers that each of our societies face is that of inequality and inequality within a country and inequality between our countries. In the case of South Africa, the legacy of apartheid still leaves us with a huge level of inequality. We are still amongst the most unequal societies in the world and have done uh, 
very little, not because of lack of effort, but because of the structural problems that apartheid has left us with, uh, in order to ensure that as many people as possible in South Africa are included in the economy of South Africa, particularly our young people. So ladies and gentlemen, the problems of the world are well known and the problems of our continents and countries are well known as well. So a long time ago, a gentleman called Lenin asked the question, what is to be done? Because I imagine that as a, as a uh, foundation and as individuals in different parts of the world, we are activists of sorts and we are asking ourselves the question, what, don't, not, what do we learn from Nelson Mandela? But also what do we do about what we learn? So the questions of today and the challenges of today must be informed by the spirit of yesterday, by the spirit of Nelson Mandela and his type of leadership, both in South Africa and indeed in the world. And perhaps one of the biggest dangers that the world faces today is <clears throat> that of a token democracy and the formalism of democracy. And here I wish to quote from a book which says how democracies die. And it says, <clears throat> the president is, uh, and I quote, the constitution is suspended or, or scrapped. On the electoral road, none of these things happen. There are no tanks in the streets, constitutions and other nominally democratic institutions remain in place, people still vote, elected autocrats maintain, <coughs> excuse me, a veneer of democracy while eviscerating its substance. Many government efforts to subvert democracy are inverted commas legal, in the sense that they are approved by the legislature or accepted by the courts. They may even be portrayed as efforts to improve democracy. For example, making the judiciary more efficient, combating corruption, or cleaning up the electoral process. I end the quotation. And it is basically saying that in today's world, it is not men and women with guns and tanks that necessarily de destroyed democracy. The democracy that Nelson Mandela gave his life for and spent 27 years in prison for. But democracy is today being eroded in all of our, all of our countries through formalism of, the formalism of democracy on the one hand, but the weakening of its institutions on the other hand. It is being undermined by fake news and digital media like Facebook that have uh, very evidently influenced, for example, the 2016 United States elections and what it will do in the next elections in the United States is still to be discovered. Other forms of digital media can <clears throat> very easily communicate all kinds of sectarian and antisocial messages that can in fact destroy the fabric of a, of a society. The, pro the promise of uh, social cohesion, peace, and conflict resolution can in fact be destroyed very easily and become a tragedy instead. Elected leaders can easily dismantle institutions in the very presence of ourselves and institutions like our, uh, your, your own and promote racial and communal conflict in order to survive politically. There's a new populism that is built on anger and despair of the masses of our people. An anger and despair that comes from the fact that they are on the margins of society, on the margins of economic benefits, and see others become wealthy whilst they themselves don't see any improvement in their lives. And as, as has been proven over the last decade, this is the climate that gives rise to what is called the strongman phenomenon where strong leaders, inverted commas, are asked to come in, take over democracies, and attempt to demonstrate that they know the answers to a country's problems. And we can see that in Brazil and in many other parts of the world today. So as I end, ladies and gentlemen, the spirit of yesterday certainly demands from the current generation of institutions like your own and activists throughout the world in our respective societies and on many different fronts on which they are engaged, to build on the same passion for social justice, equality for men and women, hope for our youth, and a better and safer world uh, for all of the people of the world. And that essentially is the message of Nelson Mandela. 
And as you know, and he said uh, the following at the end of his trial in 1964, uh, which still remains very applicable today, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and see realized. It certainly had been realized. But my Lord, if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. And that is an invitation and an inspiration for future generations of activists to take on the mantle of Nelson Mandela, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and many others, and uh, produce a more equal, more just, and uh, a more non-discriminatory world compared to the world that we live in today. Once again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Honorable Minister. You've given a wonderful inaugural address and uh, taking all the important points going on all over the world and also in South Africa and India and a present democratic setup and many other things. Thank you. Thank you. You've given a, a wonderful speech to accept our invitation and uh, participate in this meet. I'm inviting Honorable Dr. Moses Veera Sami Nagamuthu, former Prime Minister of Guyana, to launch the Nelson Mandela International Award for Conflict Resolution and uh, his, his speech. Sir, Mr. Please unmute your mic, sir. Okay. Good evening to you in, in India. And good morning here in Guyana. And we have a, a power shut down. I'm on a backup. I hope it doesn't go down uh, before I conclude uh, these remarks. But I want to uh, salute um, my uh, dear friend, uh, Pravin Gordon, and uh, uh, Chief uh, Minister Narayana Sami for their very insightful addresses and uh, uh, points of view on the occasion uh, which we are observing today. I had, in fact, sent uh, a video of my presentation, so you would forgive me if I, Dr. Sampat, if I forego the preliminaries, I want to greet all the distinguished participants uh, who are participating in this historic event. I thank you, uh, Dr. Vieira Sampat, for having invited me to take part in this event. I applaud you for your key role. And I know with your extraordinary aptitude and experience as founder of the World Panels Economic Conference, President of the Madras Development Society and ed editor of the Satakadir Law Journal, is that this event can only conclude in one way, that is tremendous success, as, as you have done in other uh, occasions. I am honored also, and very deeply honored, to launch the Nelson Mandela International Awards for Conflict Resolution. Nelson Rolala Mandela hero heroically straddled two centuries, 102 years after his birth. In life as in death, he remained in our time, for all times, a towering titan of revolutionary ideas for freedom, interracial coexistence with peace and social justice. The world is all too familiar with the epic fate of Mandela, who from the time he became politically involved in 1942, was persecuted, arrested, banned, prosecuted, and jailed. He courted death for his ideals and for his role as an activist for equality in a country where white fascists had imposed apartheid as the form of racist State power. Nelson Mandela took part in the broad based and peaceful civil disobedience struggle, then led by the African National Congress and included the South African Indian Congress and the South African Communist Party. 
But after the Sharpeville massacre of 1961, those struggles embraced elements of legitimate arms resistance to the racist state violence under minority rule. Nelson Mandela was not a pacifist. We have heard from Minister Gordon the uh, quotation, and if you don't mind, I'll repeat what he had said at the Rigonia Treaty trial. I quote, I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I'm prepared to die." Unquote. It was for that ideal that he endured the ordeal of imprisonment for 27 years. The forces of apartheid had taken away his freedom, not his conviction, not his belief, not his ideals. The rest, as we say, is now history. Mandela had taught us that in fractured societies where racism and violence are institutionalized, it is legitimate to respond in the fight for justice with diverse legal and extra legal means. To bring about reconciliation and peace, it requires, however, painstaking and purposeful negotiation and reasonable compromise. This is, in a, in a nutshell, is the essence of conflict resolution. In South Africa, when peace was brokered after years of behind the scene and secret talks, two hitherto antagonistic sides buried the proverbial hatchet after a heavy toll on human lives. The leaders founded an alliance and government, albeit short-lived, was a constructive experiment worth emulating. It shows that conflict resolution constitutes an effective alternative to fighting and bloodshed. And here I just want to mention the experience of Guyana, that we had experienced a legacy of racial polarization and division. And my own effort recently ended, of course, short-lived in the removal of my government, but it was the first time in the history of Guyana that we tried to bring the major African and Indian population together in what was a six-party coalition. I have always, in the last 60 years of my life, been committed to a government of national unity to bring all the broad forces together for ethnic peace and to end this uh, colonial-imposed division in our society. Well, we will see what happened. The uh, intervention had taken place. There has been considerable foreign interference in our elections in, in, uh, in March. And uh, we are still hoping that we can work towards a, uh, a peaceful resolution of our several conflicts. Apartheid, however, was a huge threat to world peace. It was incubated and encouraged by a powerful global class system to ensure dominance of the rich and the mighty. But it was brought down when the people were united, when the world spoke with one voice, and when the world acted together, as it did almost two decades earlier, to end the war of aggression against Vietnam. In all of that, one man symbolized the conscience of the world. One man stood all, never surrendering to evil. As the Mahatma Gandhi had advised in the context of colonial oppression in India, non-cooperation with evil is a sacred duty. Nelson Mandela did not win the battle with bullets. The people won by ballots. That example tells us that the ballot is sacred. It has been won from struggles and sacrifices. That, for me, is Nelson's, Nelson Mandela's mandate to us, to use the vote as a weapon to achieve people's power. At the ripe age of 76, 
He voted for the first time in a federal election in South Africa and was elected president of the Republic of South Africa. Today, as we observe the fight against systemic racism and state violence in the United States, we recall the sober advice of that um, adorable American civil rights leader, the late Senator John Lewis, that the answer to injustice is the vote. The answer to injustice is the vote. The end of the Cold War had tamed what one writer described as the deadly dragon, but it has given birth to a host of scary serpents styled regional conflicts. It appears that our world has been broken up into fragments, in the words of Rabindranath Tagore, by narrow domestic walls. It also has fallen prey to vested geopolitical and strategic interests and intervention by foreign powers, as Pravin Gordon has so eloquently presented. Fragmentation, however, is further compounded by the real threat of human decimation from the deadly global COVID-19 pandemic and the ravages of climate change. In this situation, we need leadership by example, not only in government, but from civil society. We need to identify, encourage, and promote leaders who, who work assiduously for socioeconomic and fundamental human rights, for peace with bread and justice, for social cohesion, equality of opportunities, decent work, and good health. We need to carry on with the Nelson Mandela mandate to fight racism and social injustice in all their forms and manifestations, wherever these exist. Our generation, in fact, no generation, can ride into the future on a wave of division, hatred, and conflict. More of us must stand up, speak out, and work selflessly, consistently, and purposefully to resolve conflict and to promote inclusion and harmony. And so, dear participants, with these remarks, it is my honor to now launch the Nelson Mandela International Award for Conflict Resolution. I congratulate Dr. Navanathiam Navi Pillay of South Africa and the Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution for being respectively the first recipient of the individual and the institutional Nelson Mandela International Award for Conflict Resolution. At the individual and institutional levels, our distinguished awardees have walked the talk and have made conflict resolution a lifelong occupation and a discipline for academic and creative pursuit. In the case of Dr. Pillay, her honor has been among her diverse professional occupations, the former High Commissioner of the UN Human Rights Commission, a judge on the bench of the International Criminal Court, and of note, the first non-white woman judge of the South African High Court. Congratulations. Thank you for your contribution towards making the world a safer place. Today, the legendary Nelson Mandela has come alive in the good work for, you, for which you have all been fittingly recognized. Thank you, Landry. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. You've given a wonderful speech and also uh, explained about the USA and other part of the world, what's going on about the conflicts and uh, among communities and uh, uh, groups. Thank you again. I'm requesting Anu Narendran to read the uh, short bio date of Nabi Pillai uh, before she's uh, replying the uh, her speech. Anu Narendran? Yes, sir. Can, Can you, you read uh, Nabi Pillai bio data? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. A uh, very good evening to one and all present here. Uh, a very good evening to all the respectful dignitaries from India, 
and a very good morning to all the dignitaries from South Africa. I am Anu Narendran, advocate from Chennai. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Madras Development Society and uh, uh, Mr. Sampath for giving me this opportunity. Her Excellency, Dr. Navi Pillai, was born in Durban, Natal province, Union of South Africa. Her Excellency is a South African of Indian, Tamil origin. She graduated as a lawyer from the University of Natal and completed her master's in the Harvard Law School in 1982 and a doctorate of juridical science in 1988. She was the first South African doctorate in law from the Harvard Law School. Her Excellency had her own law practice in the Natal province and for, for about 28 years, she relentlessly defended the anti-apartheid activists and fought against racial segregation. In 1995, when the African National Congress came to power, the Honorable President then, Nelson Mandela, himself nominated Her Excellency Navi Pillai as a judge of the High Court of South Africa. Thereafter, Her Excellency was elected by the United Nations General Assembly and she became the judge of the International Criminal Tribunal at Rwanda. In 2009, the United Nations Secretary General then nominated Her Excellency as the High Commissioner of United Nations Human Rights Commission. She has been awarded with a number of honors in her life, and one of the most important one was the Gruber Prize for the Women's Rights. In 2009, Forbes ranked Her Madam Excellency as the 64th most powerful woman in the world. Madam, it is indeed my pride and honor to give this introductory note about you. Being a lawyer myself, I will always look up to you and your achievements, and I'm determined to follow your footsteps in future. Thank you. Thank you, Anu Narendra. I'm requesting the Dr. Navi Play to give his reply speech. Uh, Wanakam and good evening to everyone. Thank you, Anil. That was a really nice introduction and I wish you well in your career. I have two daughters and neither of them wanted to do law because they said, we can see that our, our parents are working too hard and not making any money. So they didn't do law. I wish you well though. And I also want to thank His Excellency, Dr. Nagabutu for his... Uh, long introduction. Uh, before I speak about the award, uh, I'm going to respond to Dr. Sumpert's request that I also make a few remarks about peace and reconciliation. So firstly, thank you very much to the Madras Development Society for inviting me and congratulations for inaugurating this uh, Nelson Mandela Centenary International Conference on Peace and, and conflict and for the installation of a statue in honor of Mr. Mandela in the city of Chennai. I hope as soon as this virus lifts that I will be traveling to Chennai to see the statue for myself. Uh, you know, Nelson Mandela is revered for leading South Africa out of oppression and conflict into peace and democracy and he is also acclaimed internationally as the greatest moral leader of our time. Now, this is a very important message for all leaders, all political leaders today, to recognize what society expects of them once they get into power. Mr. Mandela renounced the path of vengeance and retribution, and so he carried the South African nation with him in achieving peace and reconciliation and a united country. Now, many people have quoted his own wonderful words, so I won't be doing that. Uh, let me pause to say how honored I feel to join the illustrious panel of speakers. Uh, it, it's indeed a privilege to join them. However, I do point out that they are all representative of governments so far. So I speak for the people. My life has always been as a human rights activist, lawyer and judge. And as you know, the position of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights is for 
to bring out the voice of the voiceless. Uh, now, with regard to peace, Mandela said that peace is the most powerful weapon any community of people has to bring about stability and progress through development. Now, as you know, the United Nations work rests on three pillars, peace and security, human rights and the rule of law and development. And these three pillars are indivisible, they're interdependent. One pillar can't be achieved without fulfillment of the other. So if human rights are being violated, there can be no meaningful peace. And without peace and human rights, there can be no sustainable development. So this means that when we look at peace and reconciliation, we have to adopt a holistic approach. Uh, in order to achieve that. And this is why Mandela stated that peace and democracy go hand in hand. What did he mean by democracy? He was thinking of accountable governments, that the role of governments is to work in cooperation with people. You are accountable to the gov government. But more and more in international conflicts, we see that state actors engage in shooting and killing the people. Protests all over the world are being suppressed. Freedom of speech is being denied. Dissent is not allowed. Now, all, none of this makes for good governance. Over the past decades, the international community has advanced steadily in setting standards for the protection of human rights, for safeguarding the environment, for the whole world and for ensuring peaceful resolution of conflict. A key driver of these changes has been collective action of civil society pursued with energy and resilience. In fact, there would not have been an office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN had it not been for pressure and push from civil society. So this is my message today, that we need governments to work collectively with civil society and not against them. Now, even now in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, ordinary people are taking to the streets in their thousands to protest inequalities and discrimination. Campaigns such as Black Lives Matter, the Me Too campaign, campaigns against rape and sexual harassment and gender-based violence in India, South Africa, and many other countries, and protests by civil society against authoritarian rule. These are all powerful voices demanding change, and governments must stop and listen to those voices. Now, as we know, the United Nations reaches its 75th anniversary. And it's a chilling fact that the inspiring promise of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that all human beings are born equal in dignity and rights, is still only a dream for far too many people, for millions of people in India. The World Bank estimates that 50 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty, not just poverty, but extreme poverty. The economic, social, and health impacts of COVID-19 highlight challenges of poverty, conflict, human rights abuse, and a host of setbacks. And who suffers the most? The poor women and those who are marginalized. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, has identified that the biggest threat to world peace today is the move against multilateralism. Now, if you are standing for unilateralism, as President Trump has, and some other strong men in some other countries are following his example and declaring that their countries come first, their interests and their agendas come first, then the Secretary General says that kind of unilateralism is the biggest threat to world peace. So we have to understand that no single country can fight COVID-19 on its own. And no single country can achieve an end to conflict and achieve peace unless they work together. So multilateralism is the way forward.
the collective action of all states in cooperation with civil society is necessary. We need to act globally right now to stem the rising tide of illiberal trends, such as uh, nationalism, that uh, Minister Praveen Gordon mentioned, populism and authoritarianism that threaten our peaceful coexistence. We need to act in solidarity to safeguard the planet against climate change, against threats of, to peace, and to ensure the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons. The Honorable Chief Minister of Pondicherry outlined to us the external threats outside its borders that India faces. And I truly sympathize with that because uh, it, it is a, a matter of huge anxiety to me that the people of Kashmir have not realized their human rights even after a 50 year struggle. So these are all the situations immediately surrounding India. But let me spend a moment looking at the internal situation. Not only has the virus affected India and South Africa in many uh, terrible ways in that we are losing lives, here in India, a virulent strand of Hindu nationalism labels other social groups as enemies, as anti-nationals or second-class citizens. I recall uh, in June 2019, there was a proposed draft education bill uh, making the teaching of Hindi compulsory across India and that that was defeated in Tamil Nadu after public protest. I recall to the massive marches across India and in the outside world against the Citizenship Amendment Act. The CAA supposedly grants a path to citizenship for refugees from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan but it excluded Muslims, a clear violation of international human rights law and international refugee law. And I heard a central question being asked uh, here in Tamil Nadu, which was, if the central government was so concerned over protecting minority Hindus fleeing persecution from its neighboring countries, why did the law not include Tamil Hindu refugees from Sri Lanka, who number 100,000 in India, 60,000 of whom live in camps in Tamil Nadu. So external and internal conflicts need to be addressed. And the road to reaching that is to ensure that we protect everyone's human rights. Democratic values and institutions that respect human <laughs> rights in India need strong civil society defenders at this time to ensure the peaceful coexistence of all, to ensure accountability and justice for all, and to ensure cultural uh, rights, language rights, and religious freedom for all. Mandela was a champion of human rights for all, actively promoting equality, justice, non-discrimination, as the foundation of the new democracy. And he led by sheer example. He moved away from bloodshed and vengeance and small-mindedness. He never gave in to bitterness and narrow-minded beliefs. He showed us that we cannot ever be truly free at the expense of the freedom of others. Now, you've heard the law of force, and you've heard about the force of law. There is also the power of inclusion, the strength of empathy, the deep pull of justice and the magnetism of forgiveness and love. When Nelson Mandela created reconciliation in South Africa, a country scarred by generations of racial exploitation and injustice, love triumphed over fear and hate. Empathy and inclusion triumphed over domination, power, and greed. So for if we want to achieve reconciliation, we have to ensure justice is done for all victims, that perpetrators of serious crimes are held accountable, even if they are serving on governments, they must be held accountable. 
And for reconciliation to be meaningful, there has to be reparation for victims. So these are the few conditions. Uh, and of course, many challenges still face us. And I hope that the values that Nelson Mandela incarnated, fairness, equality, and dignity, remain vivid for all of us. Mandela's legacy remains. He's gone, but his legacy remains. His example, his leadership, his extraordinary achievements will remain the benchmark against which other leaders all over the world will be measured for many years to come. Let me say how deeply honored I am to be the recipient of the first Nelson Mandela International Peace Award. Mr. Nelson Mandela directly influenced my life and work. I had never met him, but obviously he followed the work from prison of lawyers who were representing opponents of apartheid and doing so without charging fees and so on. Well, I think that, uh, that he noticed my work because he, as, as someone said, he did appoint me as the first woman judge. It was actually the first non-white woman ever in South Africa, but the first woman judge in democratic South Africa. And then he uh, phoned me. I was very surprised I received this call at home very early in the morning. I understood that he used to be up at five in the morning and started working. So I was very surprised to see the, uh, to receive a very early morning call from him. And he said, congratulations on your appointment as an acting judge. It gives me great joy. I hope it will be permanent soon. But before it became permanent, Mr. Mandela nominated me to the United Nations General Assembly, a first appointment, first nomination by Democratic South Africa for a high level post. And that's why I was elected as a judge to serve on the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. I am the granddaughter of indentured laborers. My paternal grandfather was Alugari Sami Narain Sami Naidu, who left his native village, Palia Batilagundu, outside the city of Madurai in 1880. And he worked as a cutter in the British owned sugarcane plantations in Natal. And as you know, Mahatma Gandhi described the conditions of indenture as slave labor. My maternal grandfather, Comes, came from Pondicherry, and he was rather a distinguished man who even knew how to speak French. He didn't work in the sugarcane plantations, but he also was an indentured laborer. Now, as High Commissioner for Human Rights, a few years ago, on my visit to India, I was honored with an, by an audience with former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, and I was honored formally by the Supreme Court of India. Now, both these occasions were deeply moving spiritual moments for me because I thought of my grandfather's sacrifices and the sacrifices of all the Indian indigenous laborers, particularly the Tamils, who paved the way so that I could return to India one day and be honored. And so today I'm equally deeply touched and honored to be bestowed the Nelson Mandela International Award for Conflict Resolution. I receive this award in the name of all the Indian indentured laborers who pioneered Indian settlement in South Africa. So thank you very much to the Madras Development Society. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, madam. You've given a wonderful speech and also you covered all your uh, background, our, your forefathers, our, your visit to uh, India, and also United Nations and the judge post, many other things, and uh, various issues, conflict resolution and peace process, many, many things. Thank you. Thank you. You are a wonderful reply. I'm requesting now the Anu Narendran to read the citation of Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, Austria. Thank, thank yes. you, sir. 
the Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, also known as the ASPR, was founded in September 1982. They are an independent, non-profit, non-partisan organization. <clears throat> the aim of this organization is promotion of peace and peaceful conflict resolution. They address conflict in a non-violent, constructive, and suitable means. The ASPR conduct a number of research activities every year in order to meet the objectives. They publish periodicals dealing with peace issues regularly. The ASPR also organize annual international meetings, including the State of Peace. The ASPR is the founder of the European University Center. Papa, you don't just don't need to play with anything there, just that you'll be programmed there. Oh, nice. I think uh, there's a disturbance. Yes, yes, you can talk. They have established a peace museum and a peace library at the Scaling Castle. The ASPR has also been honored with several awards for, for these many years. But some of the noteworthy awards are the United Nations Peace Messenger Award in 1987 and the UNESCO Prize for Peace Education Award in 1995. Gruden, Madam, I'm privileged and astonished by the works of the Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution. And I'm deeply honored to give this introductory note about the center. Thank you. Thank you, Anu. I'm requesting Gudrun give you a reply speech. Please unmute your mic. Yes, I hope everybody can hear me. Good afternoon. So, dear honorable contributors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is actually a great honor for me to receive this International Nelson Mandela Institutional Award on behalf of the Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution. We were told that we are receiving this award today mainly for our achievement in the field of peace education and training for peace building. So actually the ASPR was the first institution worldwide that started to train civilian experts to be deployed to UN peacekeeping missions. We responded in 1992 to UN Secretary General Boutros Ghali's request to set up training for civilians and to contribute to UN missions, also with civilian expertise. Since then, we have trained more than 6,000 civilians from all around the world. So most of them are still contributing in various forms to the field of peace building and conflict resolution today. Be it as an international peacekeeper and peace builder within international governmental organizations, or be it as local experts within community-based organizations. And I may say that also Mr. Sampat is one of our ASPR alumni, I'm very confident that many of them do really great work that has a lot of impact on the lives of people. Actually, we do not only train to send experts abroad, but we are very aware that our own society also needs peace education, as peace is not something that you achieve and then can take for granted. But peace is something you constantly have to work on and you constantly need to find societal consensus on it. One precondition for peace is their ability to deal, of course, with conflicts, contradictions and differences in a nonviolent way. So therefore, skills of conflict resolution are at the heart of our peace education program. We train every year up to 2,500 children on how to deal with conflicts in a constructive way. And we start already in kindergarten age so that dealing with conflicts in a constructive way becomes as normal as brushing your teeth in the morning and in the evening. As Nelson Mandela pointed out, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. I would like to add 
actually the most powerful weapon for the change that we desperately need to see today in this world. We need a change towards more constructive international cooperation. And I agree with Honorable Navi Pillay, cooperation on the governmental as well as non-governmental level, on the civil society level, and we need more multilateralism in order to address the global challenges we have to face in these coming decades, from pandemics like COVID-19 to also climate change. These challenges need to be addressed with a different way of thinking. We need to understand that we share a common planetary destiny and that a focus on nation state centrism with an attitude of my nation first, as Honorable Navi Pila pointed it out already, will not be able to address these planetary challenges. It will also not save our nation states. On the contrary, in order to protect our nation states, we need to take care of the others and make sure that the whole planet will develop to a more just and peaceful place as the global interconnectedness cannot be reversed anymore. In our peace education and peace building training programs, we do not only work on a cognitive level, trying to impart knowledge and understanding, but we also focus on the emotional aspects and drivers of conflict. And we think that it is very important to reflect upon our emotions, also the emotions and feelings of love we have towards our native country, our home country, and that it is not about dismissing these feelings, but it is about to expand this love to the whole planet. At the beginning of 2021, the ASPR will start its campaign Homeland Earth. It's actually a, a contribution also towards the thinking of the French philosopher Edgar Morin, who will celebrate his 100th birthday next year. And we hope that with this campaign, we can contribute to more planetary awareness. And we hope to find partners that will join us all around the world. I read the other day an article that said that the person that will walk on Mars is already born. I hope that the persons who will become planetary leaders for the common interest of the planet, humans and the ecosystem alike, are already born. And I would like to conclude with the qualities Nelson Mandela actually pointed out that are necessary for constructive leadership towards peace. It's honesty, sincerity, simplicity, humility, pure generosity, absence of vanity, and readiness to serve others. So let us keep this in mind. Once again, thank you very, very much for allocating this award to the Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution. The award inspires us to continue to contribute towards a more just and peaceful world. So thank you very much to the uh, Madras Society for Development for this award. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Dr. Goodrun, because this award will conferred physically when actually when actually installing the statue in Chennai after the Corona, the award conferring ceremony and uh, installing the statue ceremony will go uh, conduct together probably the end of the uh, year or the next year. Um, we are waiting for the uh, vaccine. After the vaccine only, the people will move here and there. So after that, only this celebration will be there. We are all we will be invited to Chennai and to organize this uh, conferring the ceremony. Thank you for your wonderful speech. Thank you I'm very much. Thank you. I am requesting Dr. G. Viswanathan, former minister, former member of parliament, and the chancellor of VIT University, to launching the project of Nelson Mandela statue. 
installing in Chennai and give his speech. Uh, good evening and good morning, uh, uh, Dr. Sampat, the president of the Madras Development Society. Am I audible? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and uh, the Honorable Chief Minister of Puducherry, our Chief Guest of today, uh, Mr. Narayan Sami, the Minister of uh, South Africa, who delivered the inaugural address, Mr. Pravin Gordon, and uh, the former Prime Minister of Guyana, Dr. Moses Vira Sami Nagamuthu, who launched uh, the international awards, and uh, Dr. Ravi Pillai, who is the first recipient of the individual award, and uh, the Austrian Society, represented by Gudrun Kramer, who was the won the institutional award, and uh, all the speakers who are going to be uh, giving special addresses in this meeting. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for participating in this uh, important conference on Nelson Mandela, who was a Nobel Prize winner and only non-Indian who was given the highest civilian award of India called Bharat Ratna. Probably he's the only leader who spent 27 years in prison for his country, his freedom and democracy. And I'm happy that the Madras Development Society is taking interest in installing a statue. And uh, I have the honor to announce about the project, which is going to be installed in Chennai. And uh, we will be happy to invite all of you for the function. Uh, probably next year. And uh, during the period 1860 to 1920, more than half a million Tamils traveled to South Africa as indentured laborers to build South Africa and they became permanent citizens. Today, we knew that uh, Navi Pillai, his origin is uh, near Madurai, Patalagundu near Madurai. We are so happy about it. And many of them, they stayed there itself. As a mark of respect for Nelson Mandela's great support to the Indian community in general, and Tamils in particular, to settle permanently in South Africa, we are instituting an annual award in the name of Nelson Mandela International Award for conflict resolution along with the statue installation of Nelson Mandela at Chennai. Uh, we are planning to install a statue in Chennai to pay our, uh, uh, our tribute on behalf of the people of Tamil Nadu for his generous decision to accept all the Indians, including Tamils, as citizens of South Africa and created history and a model to run a government with a multi-ethnic group in a peaceful manner in South Africa. We have approached government of Tamil Nadu, government of India, Corporation of Chennai and National Highways Authority of India to provide a suitable site for the statue. And also we are requesting them to donate the statue for proper maintenance, donate and maintain the proper statue. Uh, we are also waiting for the uh, reward from the agencies. Simultaneously, the committee is approaching uh, the private land in Chennai one of, in one of the educational institutions, uh, probably would not happening. Then we are also seeking donation from NGOs for this project. This project will be taken care of by Madras Development Society and various individuals with other VIPs too. The following are the members of the statue committee. Dr. G. Viswanathan, former member of parliament, chancellor of VIT University, that's myself, is the chairman. Dr. Viara Sampath, the convener of the Madras Development Society is the convener. Dr. Jagat Rachigan, Chancellor of Bharat University is another member. Mr. R. Veeramani, the Chairman of the GEM Group of Companies is another member. And we are going to include uh, some of the VIPs later in the committee. And uh, we are going to take immediate steps to install this, this statue, install the statue, and uh, have a grand function uh, to uh, remember Nelson Mandela. In fact, uh, in 1998, 
when uh, the chief minister, Dr. Kalinga Karnandi came to Vellore, uh, he laid a foundation for Nelson Mandela block in VIT University. And in 2000, it was opened. Probably uh, we have named our buildings after many leaders, but only two of them are living. One is Nelson Mandela and the other is Aung San Suu Kyi. I would like to thank uh, all the participants today and uh, probably we will invite all of you and we want all of you to be present when the uh, statue is being installed in Chennai city next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chancellor. Uh, you a very short uh, speech. I thought uh, you'll give some more <laughs> speech. No, there are many people who want to speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm inviting uh, Honorable Mr. Nasr. Al Nasr is there. Sir, Mr. Dr. Sitaraman is there or? Hello, Dr. Sitaraman? Yes, I am yes. here, Dr. Sampath. No, 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 he's uh, Mr. Nasser. Uh, Nasser is here. Okay. Nasser couldn't join. Uh, okay, okay. Then I will call you next speaker. Honorable Kanta Yamkala, please. Is there? Mr. Jabamalai, Kanta Yamkala? Yes, yes, yes sir. I'm here. Okay, sir. Yes. Sir, yes. Kanta, I want to tell you something about Kanta M. Kala. Right. Kanta M. Kala is a director, former director general of yeah. UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, situated in Vienna, and also he served as a special high level representative for energy for all, and also he served for under secretary general of United Nations, and now he's a Parliament member of Sidlonia. He was in Chennai, the University of Madras, given an honorary doctorate for uh, along with uh, Manmohan Singh, Sonia Gandhi, and Dr. Kalender, along with uh, Yamkala, also got a doctorate. Four important VAPs given doctorate, 150th year celebration of Madras University. He is a very uh, good friend of Chennai. I am very happy to invite him to give his. Uh, uh, good speech. Thank you, sir. You can start your speech. Sir, Yamkala, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sampath. I am yes, okay. I'm most honored uh, to be part of this August group of personalities to honor a great man, a great visionary, okay. uh, Nelson Mandela. I want to thank the Madras Development Society for inviting me, but for also uh, bringing us together to discuss some of the legacies of the great Nelson Mandela. The, the timing is very good. Um, it is coming at a time when indeed the world is facing a major crisis. It is not only the health crisis that some of us worry about, but it is the other aftershocks of the COVID outcome, um, out, uh, out, uh, earthquake. We see rise of populism and racism and hate around the world. We see the rise of protectionism. More importantly, now that I am in parliament myself and I'm involved in a number of global parliamentary forums, I see a growing mistrust of governments <laughs> by locals. And that is in fact exacerbated now by the response to COVID, whether in the United States, in African countries or in Asian countries or elsewhere, even in Europe, we see citizens questioning how effectively their governments are dealing with this pandemic. So the pandemic is testing uh, leadership qualities. It is testing um, our ability to come together as peoples, as societies, to solve a common problem. It is also opening up old ones and cleavages in society. So it is no surprise that we see demonstrations in Israel, in the UK, in the US, elsewhere, where people not only question uh, issues within their society, but they even question how their governments are trying to handle the pandemic. We also see reports now of governments, in fact, trying to use COVID to amass more power in the executive arm and parliaments incapable of checking that excesses of the executive arms. So yes, um, the timing is good to talk about someone 
who found himself in a situation in South Africa where similar questions were being asked about their own society. The honesty of their leadership, the discrimination, brutal discrimination of their governance systems, the inequalities that existed, and he stood up for certain values as a visionary leader to say, we don't only want to make our society better, we want to make it different. And that's the key. Mandela did not only, as a visionary, did not only want to make South Africa better, he wanted to make it South Africa different. A South Africa more inclusive, more with respect for all races, and I'm very happy that in fact, it is not us Africans honoring him, but it is the Madras Development Society that is honoring him for even the way he reached out to others who were not of African race. And I hope the world learns from this, that in fact, in the post-COVID world, we're going to need leaders from various countries that can reach out to other yeah, parts. I yeah. think my colleague, uh, uh, Nabi Pele mentioned the need for multilateralism, the need for us to reach out, especially because we see today that the economic impacts of uh, COVID-19 are in fact worsening economic conditions across the world. If we take the African context, my country, for example, a number of us did not record our first cases before March. In fact, my country recorded its first case at the end of March. But the economic impacts of COVID were already mm -hmm. with us since January. Why? Because it affected supply chains around the world. It disrupted those supply chains. It affected remittances. People were laid off, so they couldn't send monies back home. So we already mm -hmm. see the need for a better global uh, 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 situation where global governance en encourages leaders to reach across boundaries, to bring people together, to help each other out, to find a common response, a common vaccine that everybody could have access to, to have uh, systems in place that will also rescue economies that could potentially collapse. So the need for multilateralism is even higher today than before COVID came. So yes, it is right to celebrate mm -hmm. a man like Mandela, whose vision ex went beyond the borders of South Africa. And I have two of my favorite quotes of him that I used recently in parliament, but also giving a lecture to some university students. The first one he said, and I quote, we must strive to be moved by a generosity of spirit that will enable us to outgrow the hatred or conflict of the past. And many of our countries need that internally, whether in India or in the United States or elsewhere, we need that generosity of spirit to reach out to other people, especially the most vulnerable, the very poor. But we also need that generosity of spirit to reach out to, uh, across, the, uh, across boundaries, to reach out to others, whether it is to solve climate change, or in fact, it is to make sure prosperity extends so those communities can also be viable and prosperous communities. The second quotation from Mandela that I wish to quote, and I quote, reconciliation does not mean forgetting or trying to bury the pain of conflict, but that reconciliation means working together to correct the legacy of past injustices, unquote. Past injustices. We all have those in our country. We all have those past injustices. Unmute mic, please. Your mic is, please. We can create something different something that will address those injustices of the past. If we cover them up, we're just kicking the can down the road. There will be major conflicts in the future. And those conflicts will be made worse, not only because of COVID, but also because of climate change. So I end by talking about energy justice. I spent a good time, a good part of my life in the United Nations, almost two decades there, pushing for access to energy. And I did many trips to India, Sampat and others know. We still have to address the issue of global universal access to energy. Energy underpins 
our societies today. We saw it in my country on the COVID. If you don't have electricity in the hospitals, they cannot run. If you don't have access to energy, you can't pump clean water to wash hands in the schools, in the hospitals, in the homes. So you begin to again see the next source of energy to many of the things we do. Energy revolution is needed to deal with the climate change problem. We still have 3 billion people, about 700 million of them in India who, have, who, do, not have, who do not have access to clean cooking fuels. They still use charcoal, cow dung, and, uh, and, and, and biomass. That is killing so many people and creating pre-existing conditions that will make COVID worse for the poorest of the poor who rely on these dirty fuels for cooking. So I wanted to put it in context that in fact, what we should also strive for as communities of, of, of nations, whether in the UN or amongst ourselves, is how in fact we drive access to our energy, clean forms of energy, that will make societies better in the future and greener, that will clean the air for our children and our grandchildren, that in fact will also ensure clean industrialization that will create jobs and economic opportunities so people can live a better life. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. I look forward again. And by the way, I want to take this opportunity to say hello to my colleague, Justice Navi Pillay. Yes, we, we serve together in the Chief Executive's Board. I was at UNIDO. You were in the commission then. Uh, it's great to see you. And uh, I hope in the future we'll find another opportunity to thank collaborate. But this was great, Sampa. Thank you for bringing all of us together. And, and God bless you. Thank you. Not only that, your friend, Dr. Jabamala, is also there. Ah, yes, <laughs> my former yes, senior. Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, requesting uh, Mr. Ravi Pillai, Minister for Finance, Province of Natal, South Africa, to give his speech. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ravi Pillai? Hello, Mr. Ravi Pillai? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Sampath. Uh, Good uh, evening to you and good afternoon to South Africans and other parts of the world. Uh, let me acknowledge uh, Dr. Sampath, the Chief Minister of Pondicherry, uh, Mr. Praveen Gordon, I'm not sure if he's still on, uh, Prime Minister Nagamuthu, Dr. Navi Pillay, and uh, all the other distinguished speakers uh, on the panel today, as well as distinguished ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. It is often said that we must pause to enjoy the gifts of nature. The air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the warmth of the sun, and the earth beneath our feet. But as South, Afri as South Africans, we add another gift of nature, a gift to South Africans and the world, Nelson Kholishlashla Mandela. <laughs> because he would be the first to reject any title or sainthood, so it was to be expected that immediately upon his release, in his first public address after 27 years of imprisonment, he said the following, and I quote, I stand before you not as a prophet, but as the humble servant of you, the people, unquote. It is so difficult to comprehend that anyone, after such a long period of incarceration during the prime years of one's life, during which every effort was made to crush your spirit, when you are refused permission to attend the funeral of your son, that you emerge without any trace of bitterness to embrace the world and demonstrate that true leadership must be underpinned by a love of people, of humanity, and indeed of the world. It is therefore entirely appropriate that the Madras Development Society should seek to honor this towering giant of the 20th century. It is understandable that you should seek to link his historic contribution to the lives of Tamils who formed the majority of the indentured laborers who found themselves in South Africa. But let us make no mistake and immediately proclaim that Nelson Mandela's life and values was for all of humanity, breaking down all the walls that seek to divide us. We must always be bold enough to condemn and reject the ever-present danger of those who seek to proclaim some level of superiority by way of race, religion, or creed. And so there can be no debate about our position on all types of fundamentalism, whether they be Hindu, Islamic, or Christian. And 
we must do all in our power to accelerate the obliteration of the caste system. So this gathering is important not only because it honors one of the greatest statesmen of our time, but also because it shines the spotlight on the very important issue of peace and conflict resolution. More than ever before, the world needs insightful reflection on these topics. And I congratulate you, Dr. Sampath, because in the addresses that we've had thus far, we indeed have had insightful reflection on these topics. As a way of background, I would like to tell you briefly about KwaZulu-Natal, which is a state in, KwaZulu in South Africa, whose government I am part of. And I do this because I want to later draw on our experiences in the resolution of conflict. KwaZulu-Natal is one of nine provinces that constitute South Africa. It is a province of diverse cultures situated along the eastern part of the country and lapped by the warm Indian Ocean. It is in KwaZulu-Natal that thousands of Indian indentured laborers were shipped to over five decades beginning in 1860. Many of them settled there permanently and this is the reason why of all the provinces KwaZulu-Natal has by far the highest concentration of South Africans of Indian descent. Currently, South Africans of Indian descent account for 1.5 million of the total South African population of 58 million. More than two thirds of South Africans of Indian descent can be found in KwaZulu-Natal, where they constitute 8% of the province's population of 11.3 million people. And in KwaZulu-Natal, we've had our share of conflict, which I will deal with later. I am mentioning this history briefly so as to highlight the emotional and cultural connection that India and South Africa enjoy. And President Nelson Mandela put it succinctly during his visit to India in October 1990 when he said, and I quote, the indentured laborers also serve to establish an umbilical cord that ties together the peoples of our respective countries. As much as India is a particle of our country, so are we too a particle of India. History has condemned us to seek each other out, to deal with each other as members of the same family, unquote. May I pause to reflect on and pay tribute to my fellow South Africans who share this platform today. I'm sure they would all in one way or the other regard themselves as children of Nelson Mandela. Judge Navanidhan Pillay is an outstanding South African whose rise to serving as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights from 2008 to 2014 was an inspiration to millions, including us in South Africa. No such rise would have been possible without an exemplary track record in the fight and the struggle against apartheid. Your award today, Madam, is well deserved. Ravin Jamnadas Gordon is a South African of Indian origin whose contribution is really quite unmatched. Over 50 years of struggle and post-apartheid democracy, he has fought the good fight and remained true to the vision of Mandela and Gandhi. His contribution covers several epochs during which he has been at the cutting edge of taking our struggle forward. And this contribution has included his role as a student leader, the building of the Natal Indian Congress into a formidable force, the civic movement, the United Democratic Movement, the Front, the African National Congress, the underground struggle, the negotiations for a democratic South Africa, which we call CODESA, as commissioner for the South African Revenue Service, which he built into a world-class organization, and then as minister of finance, where he literally stood at the doors of national treasury and single-handedly warded off scoundrels who sought to raid the nation's wealth and cause great misery for our people. <laughs> Today, he is again, as Minister of Public Enterprises, tasked to rebuild key institutions which are vital for our future growth and prosperity. We salute Praveen Gordon. Earlier, I mentioned his full name, Praveen Jamnadas Gordon, for good reason. There are those in our country, not many, who would seek to use his middle name in a dangerous and derogatory way and who will not hesitate to use the most outrageous lies to denigrate him and seek to reduce his moral authority. They have failed. Unfortunately, another South African of Indian origin, Satyadranath Raghunan Makmaraj, could not join us today. It would have been most appropriate to have him address us as someone who would have known perhaps 
Nelson Mandela the best, having served 12 years in Robben Island with him and later as a member of Mandela's first cabinet and lifelong friend and comrade. Yesterday, we laid to rest Lieutenant General Vijay Nand Indrajit Ramlakan, who rose to the top ranks of the South African National Defense Force. His funeral was an official state funeral with full military honors, broadcast live on national television. The prayer was performed by a Hindu priest of the South African Defense Force. Speaker after speaker acclaimed his sterling, courageous, and exemplary contribution in the struggle for freedom, including imprisonment on Robben Island, and his contribution to building our democratic South Africa. Vijay was completely South African, embracing all her people in equal measure. His daughter spoke of the joys of celebrating Diwali, now accepted as a natural part of our democratic society. Nelson Mandela, together with many others like Vijay Ramlakan, made that possible. Comrade Vijay's life must be celebrated and motivate all of us to re-energize our historic activism in the interests of the public good. Our vision of a truly united, democratic, non-racial, non-sexist, and prosperous South Africa is not guaranteed. It has to be worked for. It has to be defended. There's again a need for the best and talented amongst us to bring forth their skills and claim their space in the task of building the capable state, strengthening our social compacts, and contributing to a rational policy debate on several key issues. Our economic framework and the post-COVID-19 economic recovery plan and its implementation now becomes our top priority. Nelson Mandela did not give us a democratic South Africa on a platter. He gave us the real possibility of building one, and so too for the world. Of course, Nelson Mandela's main contribution to the theme of peace and reconciliation was in the greater South African state. There are many examples of him using his leadership skills to overcome really dangerous hurdles on this journey. One such example was on the great tragedy of the murder of our most popular General Secretary of the South African Communist Party and NEC member of the ANC, Chris Harney, who many would say would have been a future president of our country. His death caused outrage and mobilized millions of followers whose anger had to be directed. We stood at the edge of a civil war that would have plunged our country into misery for decades to come. It was Nelson Mandela, not the then president after we declared, who had to go on national television and lead our people away from that ghastly prospect. Another instance closer to home for us in KwaZulu-Natal was a simmering conflict between Nkata, led by Mangosuthu Butulezi and the ANC. More than 20,000 lives were lost in that conflict. Again, it was Nelson Mandela who led us away from our anger and short-sightedness to build a sustainable peace which still endures today. In his address to a rally in Durban on 25 February 1990, Nelson Mandela stated, and I quote, in Natal, apartheid is a deadly cancer in our midst, setting house against house and eating away at the precious ties that bind us together. This strife among ourselves wastes our energy and destroys our unity. My message to those of you involved in this battle of brother against brother is this. Take your guns, your knives, and your pangas and throw them into the sea. Close down the death factories. End this war now. He went on to say, we also come together today to renew the ties that make us one people and to reaffirm a single united stand against the oppression of apartheid. We have gathered here to find a way of building even greater unity than we already have. Unity is the pillar and foundation of our struggle to end the misery which is caused by the oppression which is our greatest enemy. This repression and the violence it creates cannot be ended if we fight and attack each other close quote. And yet there are scars that have not been completely healed. The impact on society as a whole and the trauma on individuals families and communities are issues for a democratic government and society as a whole and must be dealt with in a visible and genuine way. 
There are other fault lines in our society. The legacy of the conscious, divisive, hierarchical nature of apartheid oppression. There is not yet enough common conversation about this and our future across the social and political spectrum. There are deeper issues beyond party politicals, party politics, which need our attention. And in doing so, Nelson Mandela would remain our beacon. As far back as 1979, while still incarcerated, the Indian government conferred on Nelson Mandela the Jawaharlal Nehru Award for international understanding for his outstanding contribution to the promotion of international understanding, goodwill, and friendship among peoples of the world. So South Africans generally, and especially Tamil people in South Africa, will be most inspired by the recognition in Tamil Nadu of our Nelson Mandela. We are on the one hand in awe of your ability in Tamil Nadu to overcome the legacy of colonialism and the inherent challenges of a multicultural society. Tamil Nadu, a state of some 70 million people, can hold its head high. Your achievement of the second largest economy among Indian states is significant. We envy your success in your industrialization program and we want to learn from it. We marvel at the world-class development of your ICT sector, and we wish to emulate that. We believe that we too have skills and talent in our country. And yet, as has been said, both our countries have great underdevelopment and poverty. And this must remain our key preoccupation as we marshal all our resources towards achieving a just society, contributing to a better world as Nelson Mandela did. Today, India is a key player on the world stage. The size of the Indian economy is predicted to ultimately overtake that of both China and the USA. Tamil Nadu is a key state in India. And with that comes the great responsibility of contributing meaningfully to a better, safer, more equal world, a sustainable world that future generations will look back on with respect for our efforts. In conclusion, let me say that surely the ultimate message of Nelson Mandela's life must be that peace and reconciliation is only sustainable if underpinned by justice. I thank you, Nandri. Thank you, Honorable Minister. You've given a detailed explanation and a speech, a speech about the various issues and also Tamil Nadu and we were uh, uh, Tamil people in South Africa. Thank you. I'm inviting Honorable Justice Durai Karanagaran, former Chief Justice of Supreme Court of Seychelles. Justice Durai Karanagaran? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Mr. Sambath. Okay. Honorable Chief Minister of Pondicherry, Mr. Narayan Swami, Honorable Ministers from the Republic of South Africa, his Excellency, former Prime Minister of Guyana, Her Excellency, former High Commissioner of UN Human Rights Commission, distinguished and our beloved Dr. V.R.S. Sampat, a President of Madras Development Society, distinguished Chancellor of VIT University, Honorable former Chairman of UN General Assembly, respected Chairman of Hindu Group of Companies, Mr. Yen Ram, Ladies and gentlemen, wanna come a good evening to you all. All protocols observed. A greetings from the Republic of Seychelles. I am delighted to be invited to address on this historical international conference. I am very thankful to all of you for having given me the privilege, time and opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you only about Nelson Mandela, the Bharat Ratna, and the greatest son of Africa without entering into the area of conflict. I mean conflict resolution and international peace since other speakers specialized in that area have already covered it very well. Having said that, Mandela was not simply a South African anti-apartheid revolutionary or a political leader or a philanthropist but ideologically an African nationalist par excellence. In the barometer of Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the Indian nation, I quote, a man becomes great exactly 
in the degree in which he works for the welfare of his fellow men, unquote. And so Mahatma Mandela, the father of the South African nation becomes the greatest in the list in every sense of the term and by any and every standard. The world has conferred on this great man more than 250 honors, including the Nobel Peace Prize. All these honors we do for him to commemorate his remarkable achievements in life by conferring of awards, naming buildings and roads, erecting statues, making publications, writing books, speeches on him, etc., may only reflect the minimum degree of honor we do for him. But the greatest honor one can do for this great man of principle is to follow and try to practice what he taught us from his own principle-centered role model life and by applying his value-based principles in our day-to-day -day personal as well as social life and serve our fellow men as he did. This would surely put his great soul to rest in eternal peace since he always believed and taught us that service to fellow men is service to God. The last decade of the 20th century will not be forgotten in the political history of Africa. This was the decade in which the freedom struggle against the last vestiges of racial oppression in Africa came to an end. This was the decade in which Nelson Mandela wrote eology to his long walk to freedom. This was the decade in which the rainbow nation was born with the full blossom on the horizon of good, good hope. This was the decade in which the people of Africa, particularly South Africa, after experiencing a cycle of different political enslavements, discriminations, oppressions, and exploitations, eventually attained freedom from apartheid, the institutionalized inhuman segregation and discrimination. This is the decade in which Mandela marched his nation towards political transition to achieve political maturity and national stability. He set sail for the nation on a historic voyage from an apartheid state towards a vibrant pluralist free democracy with universal franchise. He succeeded in abolishing all discriminations against humanity in South Africa. He ensured that the torch of liberty, equality, and fraternity, which he lighted, was passed on from one generation to another to shine forever as steady as a lighthouse on the shores, on the mountains, and on the valleys of South Africa. Apartheid came to an end. Mandela realized his dream in the early 1990s. In 1994, Mandela was elected the first president of South Africa and a democratic government was formed. His political voyage began with a dream, the South African dream, if I may call it that, a dream of a modern sovereign democratic republic in which life was better, richer, and fuller for every South African without discrimination, whether based on race, color, religion, political belief, creed, or sexual orientation. He strived to establish a society based on equality of opportunity to enjoy freedom, justice, welfare, fraternity, peace, and unity. His dream was not based on an illusion, but on a vision that sprouted from his ability to go beyond the invincible and touch the future with his rainbow fingers. His dream was not about problem solving, but the preemption and prevention of problems. The people of South Africa thus decided under him to rewrite their own political destiny 
and they did so with a style of their own. It was a historic promulgation of President Nelson Mandela on the 18th of December 1996, and the constitution came into effect on the 4th February 1997. South Africa was born after much brainstorming, reflection, ideological debate, and intellectual labor, and finally delivered through by promulgation of Nelson Mandela. He proclaimed that the Republic of South Africa is a sovereign democratic state founded on the values which all civilized nations believed in, the human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms, non-racialism, non-sexism, the rule of law, and universal adult suffrage were the cornerstones of his political philosophy. Through his political wisdom, uh, a pluralism flourished. People celebrated unity in diversity. He recognized and appreciated the contribution by people of different races, colors, tribes, and origins, including Indo-African, and particularly of Tamil origins for the evolution and building of the rainbow nation. The South African dream has now taken shape with roots that give it a stronghold on ground realities and wings that give it the ability to reach new heights. On a personal note, I would confess that Mandela has always been and is still my political hero the African continent has ever produced. Having said that, I would like to recall a blessing of my lifetime. I once had an opportunity to personally meet this great hero in Pretoria that was in the year 2001 on the fringes of a Commonwealth conference. The memories are so vivid, deep, and the tall figure, I would say in every sense, is still inspiring me. Before I conclude, I should mention that a reading and rereading of his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, has always given me a unique experience and inspiration. Every time when I read it, I recall an incident happened during his terrible prison life over 27 years in Robben Island. Tears would roll down when I empathize with him recalling his own words of unbearable hunger, shivering cold, covering himself in a gunny sack, weakness due to fever, waiting for two slices of bread and a glass of milk, but that too on one particular night, giving even that scanty food to his fellow prisoner as he was then shivering and dying of high fever in the adjacent cell. But this great man survived. Though made of flesh and blood like you and me, really walked on this planet and preserved his life over 27 years of isolation in prison for a cause he believed in to achieve. Recalling that night, Mandela writes in his long walk to freedom, thus which I quote, human body has an enormous capacity for adjusting to trying circumstances. I have found that one can bear the unbearable. If one can keep one's spirits strong, even one's body is being tested. The strong convictions are the secrets of surviving deprivation. Your spirit can be full even when your stomach is empty. Unquote. What an inspiring philosophical thought and guiding principle for all of us to follow. This is what exactly even the great Tamil saint, philosopher, come, poet, Kumara Gurubara of the 17th century says in his treatise, Nidhi Neri Vilakkam, thus in Tamil, Meivaruttam parar pasinokkar kanthunjar Yavavar Timayum Merkolar, Sevi Arumayum Parar, Abamadipum Kollar, Karmame Kanayinar. Meaning in English, those that are resolved and focused 
on doing a thing with strong spirit, never mind their bodily exertion. Feel no hunger, feel no sleep, care not for the hindrance of others, regard not the unsuitability of time, and never mind the scoffs or scorns of others. They don't see what is thrown on them, whether flowers or brick bats. They indeed survive all deprivation and suffering and eventually succeed in achieving what they wanted to and had resolved to achieve. Before I conclude, I must say the greatest glory of a man lies not in never falling, but in raising every time he falls. This is what Nelson Mandela believed in his life and taught us. And on the issue of peace, since I haven't touched the topic, what I believe to be a relevant quote from John F. Kennedy, when the United States of America was facing a Cuban Missile Crisis, when the Cold War was at peak with the Soviet Union, he talked about peace, which I believe is very relevant today in the Asian context. He said, we want peace. We want peace with Soviet Union. We want peace not because we are weak, but because we are strong. I think this message conveys a lot of things to India as well as to neighboring countries. Uh, thank you very much. I, I thank you all for your kind indulgence. May God bless Bharat. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Justice. You've given a detailed speech about Nelson Mandela and peace and conflict resolution. I'm inviting uh, Honorable Mr. Tiruchi Siva, Member of Parliament, Rai Sabha from Chennai. From Tamil Nadu. Sir, unmute your mic, sir. Okay, sir. Unmute. Still not unmute. It's okay. Okay, okay. You can speak. Okay, sir. Okay, your mic is all right. Huh? Your mic is our mic the volume increase for Solana. Please increase your mic volume. You are not increased your volume. Your mic is okay, only you increase your volume. Increase your volume. Okay. Increase your volume. Your mic all right. You are already unmuted. You are also unmuted. Only thing you have to increase your volume. Yes, you talk though. Sir, okay, sir. Okay, come on. I think you. The earphone is the port to pass. The earphone is the port to pass. And the connection is the solar. It's the ringer. And I'll move on my boho. You remove your ear for remove, then it will be all right. I think you are talking with iPhone. And the connection. Okay, I will be. Uh, uh, can you be ready in meantime? I am inviting a uh, radiator. Mr. Tirichi Siva. You are all right, or can you 
call you after uh, Mr. Ram. Okay, I'm calling, I'm requesting Mr. Ram to deliver his speech. Sir, Mr. Ram, sir. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay. Your excellencies, all protocols observed. Uh, I'm, uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, international conversation or conversations and you heard some very fine ideas uh, and insights into how the world should be drawing on the magnificent life and work of uh, Nelson Mandela uh, or Madiba, as he was widely known. It will be impossible to do justice to the qualities of Nelson Mandela, his life and work because they are so multifaceted. And uh, it will also be unnecessary because, uh, you know, this is extremely well known. But what one draws inspiration from is his indomitable courage. His, uh, his gen he was gentle as well as firm in dealing with uh, ma all manner of issues. He was he stood up against r racist humiliation with tremendous, in fact, monumental patience, uh, but also with a radical or revolutionary will to liberate himself and his people from the nightmare of apartheid. And by extension, all manner of uh, injustices, atrocities, and so on around the world. And it is this spirit that uh, one draws inspiration from. I had the privilege of uh, meeting him, of course, although very briefly, at a reception given by the then Prime Minister when uh, Madiba made his first visit to India in 1990. It was in Delhi. As, as a journalist, I was also a part of the uh, Indian media delegation that uh, covered the inauguration of uh, President Nelson Mandela. And the last time I saw him was from a distance was during the World Cup, which was held at the at Soccer City Stadium in Joburg on July 11, 2020. Very frail, but he was being driven in a vehicle and it was a glorious moment for many of us. And uh, so I, and I'm delighted that so many distinguished political figures and jurists from drawn from largely from uh, from the Indian community or, or people of Indian origin, but also some others uh, are offering their insights uh, and their uh, suggestions on what needs to be done, what should be done. And I just want to make a few quick observations because uh, you know, we're getting on and there are other speakers as well. But I want to highlight the lessons uh, we drew. This, his famous uh, speech or, this, or, or, or these excerpts from his famous speech during the Rivonia trial. This was, I, I believe, on April 20, 1964, has already been recalled about how I have fought against white dom domination and I have fought against black domination and then the ideals he stood for. No need to repeat it. But those words uh, ringed true even today. Uh, he started out uh, as an advocate, as a supporter of the armed struggle and ended up uh, in, a, in a different place. Although there was no inconsistency whatever in the way he pursued his goals or ideals. Uh, let us also remember that those who lionized him, revered him, showered him with all kinds of honors, as late as the 1980s, called him a terrorist. And among those who uh, used those uh, derogatory phrases were uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and President Ronald Reagan. So the world has changed and the towering, the achievements of one towering man, of course he was part of a movement, the, African National Congress and its various const heroic constituents, including the Communist Party of South Africa, 
but one man became the symbol of uh, the fight against uh, injustice, but in a way that was extremely constructive. That has to be remembered throughout. I remember as somebody who follows sports, I remember the, his, uh, the, the methods he followed in enabling South Africa soon after he became president uh, to uh, uh, host and indeed win the first, uh, the third rugby world cup. The way he, you know, this was a white uh, preserve before that, but the way he built harmony out of something that was awful, ra dominated by racism was just uh, magnificent. I also had the opportunity of visiting Robben Island and also entering the cell in which uh, uh, Nelson Mandela was incarcerated for, uh, I believe, 18 out of the 27 years he spent in prison. And uh, that was at, at, at one point a, a pilgrimage. It was a learning experience and it was also an opportunity to recharge your moral batteries. The stories we heard there, uh, you know, just to be there was something uh, very, very special. I just want to draw a couple of lessons for, for India, particularly with for India from what he stood for and what he taught all his uh, you know, life. India is not in a happy place today. India is riven with divisions. Our distinguished speaker, uh, Navi Pillai, I was very pleased that she, uh, she spoke truth about uh, the situation in Jammu and Kashmir, in human rights violations, in the specter of communalism as a political mobilization strategy. References is also, also made in this conference to uh, the ways of uh, Hindu Rashtra, the Hindu right. Of course, we have to be even handed and oppose uh, communalism, divisive strategies, chauvinism, wherever it comes from, whether it is from the majority, in the, from the uh, whether it's, uh, it's resorted to in the name of the majority or in the name of minority communities, whether it is Muslim or Christian or whatever. And that even handedness, I think, is very important. But having said that, today, India is being threatened. Our constitutional values, it is a very fine constitution. And I think in some respects, in South Africa, you improved on the, the, the values that are built into the Indian constitution because much had been learned by that time. And in many ways, uh, we look up to the South African constitution. Those of us who believe in uh, justice, in equality, in having to transform the world from where it is to a place that people like Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi and others, Jawaharlal Nehru, etc., aspired to, as well as other revolutionaries, aspired to, but uh, I think uh, it, it is the extreme right, Hin the Hindu, so-called Hindu nationalists, they're not nationalists because they divide the nation and it, it is a misnomer. But I think today, the way they are going after the values embedded in the Indian constitution and also represented by the South African constitution, these universal values, as Navi Pillai spoke about, I think uh, is, is a very serious concern because as a journalist, I cannot possibly remain silent on this when we are speaking about uh, a subject uh, that is uh, the theme of this uh, conference, how to resolve, how to build peace, peace building and con conflict resolution. I believe that India can do much better in dealing with uh, its neighbors. I'm not saying that all that they do is right. There are issues, there are problems, many of them left over by history, such as the boundary question with China, such as the problems of Kashmir uh, with, with Pakistan, such as issues with Nepal or earlier even with Sri Lanka on the Tamil question. But for all this, India has done well in some areas, Indian governments as well as the, you know, the political community uh, and the public. But uh, we, could, we should do much better I don't believe that you can shut off all contacts, political contacts at the highest level, just because there are some issues, whether it is terrorism or an unresolved question. I think the need is to normalize relations. 
have good relations in all areas and simultaneously try to address these issues. Secondly, I'm very seriously concerned about a certain tilt in India's foreign policy. Because uh, let us remember that Nelson Mandela, once you, he had turned down this uh, the offer of a second term, the possibility of a second term, was a free man and could say things like, he described, I remember, Tony Blair as Bush's foreign minister. I think that was in the context of the war, Iraq war and also, yeah. And uh, he also said when, when he was a free man, after he had served a term as president, that if there is a country that has committed unspeakable atrocities in the world, it is the United States of America. I certainly believe that, but there are those who may disagree with it. But the fact that a statesman, perhaps the, along with uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the greatest uh, person on, uh, you know, in, uh, in the world, on the planet, in the 20th century, or one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest, uh, that he could say such things, I think uh, is a lesson for all of us. We should not, we should not in the name of diplomacy, remain silent on these issues. I was also pleased to see references are made to the uh, Citizenship Act, also by implication, the National Register of Citizens and so on, targeting Indian Muslims. Uh, there's no doubt about it. We have to address these issues ourselves and there is nothing wrong if people of goodwill who live abroad, particularly those who know the Indian situation well, speak up on these issues. Whether it is uh, a congresswoman in the United States or somebody of Indian origin in South Africa or in the Caribbean or uh, in, in Seychelles or anywhere, if they speak the truth on this, we as independent citizens should certainly cherish that and learn from that. This is, this is something that uh, uh, we, we should learn from those like Mahatma Gandhi and also Nelson Mandela uh, in the most recent period. So I'm delighted that my friend, Dr. Sampath and the Madras Development Society has uh, actually brought so many people together and was mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, this is a, this is a time of great challenge, great stress, even a crisis on a global scale, unprecedented. But a, a few of the advantages are that we can bring people together like this, which could, would not, which could not be done earlier without going through great trouble and expense. So thank you for this opportunity. And I hope that uh, these conversations will be continued on a sustained basis. No use just holding one conference. These issues have to be discussed continuously uh, and new insights are to be brought together, new experiences and solutions have to be found. Only then would we be paying a real tribute to one of the greatest, one of the heroes of our, of our modern times, Lancel Mandela. Thank you, Dr. Sampat and uh, everyone else who's uh, been part of this excellent effort. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ram. You gave a wonderful speech. And you are the oldest and the largest English newspaper in India. You can uh, carry out this information also to reach all over the world. You are the person to give a speech. Wherever you go, you can you always give a giving a open and frank speech, and also the real speech that is your speech. Thank you. I am requesting uh, Mr. Trichy Siva. Member of I'm not going on in. Yes. yes. Okay. Sir, thank you very much. Mike, all right. okay. Good evening to one and all. All? Good evening to all the dignitaries who are present. Good evening. Sometimes I am audible. I, I, my mic is on. You are audible, you are audible. My mic is on. Continue. Continue, Shiva, continue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening to all the dignitaries who have participated in this wonderful conference organized by Dr. Sampar.
the president of the Madras Development Society and the editor of Satakadi Law Journal taken the initiative. And it is not a surprise that he has taken the initiative because he's an ardent follower of the Dravidian movement principles. He's very much acquainted with the ideologies of Peria, Rana, and Kalinga. So I thank him very much. And uh, he has assured that the statue of Nelson Mandela would be unveiled after the corona episode is over. South Africa and across the world have deliberated very much and paid tribute to Nelson Mandela and his centenary celebrations. As the previous speakers have spoken, he is also a Mahatma, he is not a leader confined to South Africa alone. He is a leader of the world and the universe. I heard in the present for 27 years as having been said, oh, there are some people who are languishing in prisons for more than two decades. While paying tribute to Nelson Mandela, who is a Nobel Prize winner of the peace, uh, Nobel for Peace, and also the Bharat Ratna and Jawaharlal Nehru Award, too many awards. We have to recollect something. He was imprisoned in the year 1962. And even in the year 1966, the International Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination didn't find a solution. The court struggled to differentiate the meaning of, find out the meaning of the word race and racial discrimination. Only a representative from South Africa cleared that it is not explicit but can be understood. But it didn't fetch any desired result. It is in the 1978 gave a detailed and nuanced description of race that all human beings belong to one single species and are descendant of one common stock and right to be different. And it also further elaborated, I, I think it's the right time to recall all those things because those days are not yet over. It has included, racism includes racist ideologies, prejudiced attitudes, discriminatory behavior, structural arrangements and institutional practice resulting in racial inequality as well as the fallacious notion that discriminatory relations between groups and morally and 1990 the apartheid came to an end in south africa when the day dawned when Nelson mandela succeeded and as mr ram so there, I also had the privilege of visiting the prison where he was imprisoned. And uh, in, in a particular place, there is a heap of pebbles, like a small mountain. When I asked what it is, they said, every stone has been placed there, starting from Nelson Mandela. And all the prisoners, fellow prisoners of him, have put one for an identity and still it is being there. It has not been disturbed. It is as it was placed by each and every of those prisoners who were with Nelson Mandela. And the United Nations very rightly honored him in the year 2009 of declaring his birthday as the International Nelson Mandela Day. And it dedicated 69 minutes of his precious time to speak one minute about one every year of his service. So on this day, you are going to unveil a statue of him. We are celebrating the centenary celebrations as uh, Mr. Nair, the previous Supreme Court justice spoke. Tamil Nadu has always been a pioneer in such things. And uh, we have always voiced for social justice and equal rights for all. But I have to stand with Mr. Ram now who said that India is facing a very tough time. Challenge has been thrown to the pluralism, the composite culture, the doctrine of unity in diversity, 
And in Nigeria, 60 human rights activists who have fought against discrimination of ra racial, who have fought against racial discrimination have been killed in Nigeria. And in India also, those who voice for human rights and those who are against the authoritarianism of the government are being killed. So we have, the days are not yet over. Apartheid is not confined only to South Africa. Racial discrimination after all these years have not come to an end. The displaced people of Sri Lanka have not yet been rendered justice. So many people are missing. No solution for that. And in India, casteism plays a main role. And surprisingly or shockingly, the latest news that has come is come as that in Chicago, in the US, in the, year, in the month of April, the statistics very clearly revealed that out of the total number of COVID-19 persons who have died, 72% are only black people, though they constitute only one third of the population in Chicago. The population is one third, but the death rate is 72% means medical facility is not yet extended to those people. Languishing very much behind without any basic rights. In Philippines, there are low, it is very low level of investigation, prosecution and conviction on racial discrimination. So I feel that on this right occasion, when we are celebrating the centenary of a great leader who has fought for years, who has suffered 27 years of imprisonment and has brought the relief to the people of black in the South Africa who have been victimized for long decades, for centuries. We have to recall and take a solemn pledge that the days are not yet over. We have to fight on the path of such leaders to bring an end to this sort of discrimination in any form whether it is caste, creed, color, religion, ethnicity, racial, anything. We have to fight against. And today is the right day, I think, to take a pledge that we will walk on the path of Nelson Mandela to put a full stop to all these discriminations. And we should see a world where all people are equal, where all people are enjoying equal rights. The government of the day should be for all the people and not for one section of the people. Democracy is not a rule of majority only. It is also the protection of the rights and sentiments and feelings of the minority also. It is the day when it comes only that the sufferings and the ambitions and aspirations of these leaders have come into reality. And so we all who have assembled here, all dignitaries, all learned people, let us take this message to the other people to su succeed in the path of what we have to which is an urgent call at this moment, especially in India, where a tough time is going on, when the power is strong with the authoritarians, and we have to fight strong to establish pluralism and unity in diversity and secularism and to save our and uphold our constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, Mr. Trichy Siva. You've given a wonderful speech and also we all enjoyed about your various references and also India's situation, international situation and your visit to South Africa. Thank you. And I'm requesting Dr. R. Sita Raman Chief Executive Officer of Doga Bank from Doga to give his speech. Thank you, Dr. Sampat. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and privilege to be an integral part of this interesting and exciting conference. Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, they all have fought for social justice freedom and functional democracy. There's a beautiful oriental saying, if you aim at short term, you cultivate flowers. If you aim at medium term, 
you cultivate trees. If you aim at eternity, you build humanity. That is precisely Nelson Mandela has set in by his sacrifice. Extraordinary set of efforts, reconciliation before recrimination, harmony before conflicts. And that is precisely the purpose behind his drive. When he wrote a letter to Benny Mandela from the Robben Island, he emphasized on the internal drive, the positivity, the freedom, the generosity, the determination, the drive, and the values which you have to imbibe in your internal integration between heart and mind is eternal. And that will radiate into value-based behavior, collective behavior of the society. That is his deep-rooted sense of vision and the mission which he executed when he came to power. Look at the generosity in, in terms of his forgiveness. Extraordinary set of commitment to society, plural society to make sure we define all the logics when it comes to personal advantage in a, as a common man, but he sacrificed for the sake of society and brought in the value systems, which is totally universal and eternal. More than ever, when we are facing the a global pandemic on account of various risk, human risk, social risk, economic risk, and environmental risk. We recognize his value systems, his fundamental philosophy is more meaningful at this defining moment. Pravin Gordon was ex, you know, setting a right kind of tone for this conference when he said, we live in a changing world, changes, extraordinary set of changes are happening from globalization to economic nationalization and nationalization without looking at the overall humanity is going to be a despair. But precisely we are in a defining moment to understand the entire sustainable development goals were setting with a committed discipline of the value system of Nelson Mandela. Eradication of extreme poverty, that was his principal centered focus. That's what we need to look at it. Look at today, it's not only 28 million people are impacted on account of COVID. We lost nearly a million people, 880,000 people, but the, the post-COVID impact is yet to be quantified. The food security is going to be a major thrust, and we, he emphasized when he was internalizing his issues. Look at the, the change in dynamics he brought in in terms of value systems for gender equality. Navi Pillai was a classic example when he gave eminence to her profile. Universal health care, he was emphasizing. He was emphasizing building a green economy. We are seeing today rising temperature, increasing sea levels, animal extinction. You are seeing, you know, carbon emission today is dominating the world. We are not leaving this world for future generations for well off. We have to create a carbon neutral society that was his committed mission as well. When it comes to peace, justice within the enterprise definition or institutional definitions, he was emphasizing peace with reconciliation. It's all about recognizing these leaders like Mahatma, integrating on one thing, consciousness, and that is precisely the message. If you change your internal discipline, external dispositions becomes more meaningful and it becomes collective as a culture. And that is the one single responsiveness True to your heart, you behave. True to your reflection of humanity for bringing the parity and shared humanity is ultimate. And that is the single message we need at this point of time. And that's what we need to draw in this universal epidemic. We will take the lessons from him. We will draw the discipline from him. We will change ourselves. We will change the rest of the world in the name of Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sita Raman. You've given a very short and uh, detailed uh, explanation about the various issues, especially Kovyat matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm requesting Mr. T.K. Sinilangovan, Member of Parliament, to give his speech. Dr. V.R. Sampat, President of Madras Development Society, Honorable Chief Minister of Puducherry, 
Guru V. Narayana Sami and distinguished guests. This is an occasion which I see with pride. A man who fought for the cause of the human being, a man who fought for equality among human beings. Man is an animal. He is a different animal. But what we see is we distinguish, we differentiate among men, human beings. In a civilized society, differentiating among human beings because of color, because of birth, because of caste, because of language, is, I, I, I don't know how, un, uh, how civilized this thought is. Nelson Mandela fought for this. Because of color, a man could not come to power. A human being could not come to power. It's a shame to the humanity. This was preached by another human being. It was fought by Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela breathed his last at the age of 95. When he thought of it, I, I think of Tandai Piriyar Eve Ramasami Nayakar, who also breathed his, breathed his last at the age of 95. They both fought for equality. Human beings, human leaders, Fighting for equality among human beings is something which is, I, I can't understand how it can happen. How can a man be different from another man? How can a man be less than another man? That is what is happening and in a civilized world, particularly when others spoke about various governments. I think the role of a civilized democratic government is restricted to providing socio-economic protection to its citizens. Nothing beyond that. Nothing more than that. The individual's right is not the uh, government's. Uh, government cannot look into the individual's rights. It was provided in every country's constitution. So, the only role of any government any democratic civilized government is to provide socio-economic protection to all its citizens. Beyond that, if any government goes beyond that, then it is not a civilized government. It, I can call it a barbaric government. That was, that was what had happened in South Africa, for which Nelson Mandela had to spend 27 years in prison. For which here in India, where for which Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi had to lose his life. And the Periyar had to fight for the cause of, uh, for equality among the Indians, among the Tamilians. Parapokum yalla uirkum. This is the saying of Valduar. All men are born equal. That is the saying of Valduar. When this is not respected by another human, my fellow human being, I wonder how, what kind of uh, a human being he must be when he, I think somebody lower than me, when I think somebody lower than me because of color, because of creed, because of language. That is, uh, that is not human thinking, that is not human approach. So as human beings, we had to fight for our rights and this is the day where we must take a vow that we should once again see that such apartheid is not brought in by any government in power, any group in power. Just because they, we, if they have power, they cannot do anything against another human being. So this day, we think of Nelson Mandela only to see that the plight, the fight, the sufferings he had undergone to ensure that Human beings, all human beings are equal. So we must also think in terms of uh, equality among human beings and fight for the cause of the human being. And there should not be any difference, distinction, oppression, depression, just because of caste, color, or language. With these words, I once again congratulate people who had been awarded with various distinguished awards and the good uh, intention of 
erecting a statue of Nelson Mandela, which will also be a lesson to all Indians. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Elangovan. You've given a wonderful speech. Uh, another 10 minutes is the, our uh, conference will be over. Just one more speaker, uh, then a word of thanks, please. And uh, now, the, Mr. Laurie Ferguson, former member of parliament, will give a speech. One minute. I will open. I don't know how to open. I will see. Alphabets, Pran Paranga. Bloody the file. Anyway, uh, I'm able to uh, play that video message. I put it in the uh, YouTube. People can watch his uh, speech. And I'm requesting Mr. Logan Aidu, former deputy mayor from Durban, South Africa, to give your vote. Is, uh, under his vote of thanks. Mr. Logan Aidu? Mr. Logan Aidu? Mr. Logan Aidu? Yirkar, he is there. He is there. We are waiting for him. Mr. Logan Aidu? Ah, yes, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Dr. Sampath, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, you can say your vote of thanks and your speech. Yes, sir. Unmute your I, mic. Unmute Pandla, sir. Ah, Pandita. You are here, Mr. Mayor Chitra. Yes, Mr. Logan Aidu. You can talk. Yes, Mr. Logan Aidu. You can give a speech. Welcome. Ah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Welcome to Dr. Sampath Madras Development Society for organizing this in honor of Nelson Mandela. Last year we observed his centenary year and uh, certainly he's been a world icon and an inspiration to people all over the world. A prisoner of conscience, he was a symbol of hope for a very divided uh, apartheid South Africa. For me, the most profound saying of Nelson Mandela was his quotation about peace and reconciliation. And he said, I quote, as I stepped out of my prison cell, I realized that if I did not leave behind all the bitterness and anger that I have, I will forever remain in this prison. Those were the most profound words that he said to bring about peace, reconciliation, democracy, and freedom in South Africa. But as a prisoner of conscience, he inspired people throughout the world. Um, Nelson Mandela was indeed an international icon and he fought for freedom. And many of the previous speakers spoke about that by his attorneys, by his lawyers, send you to the gallows. They will hang you by the neck. He said, if that was the case, so be it. He was prepared to lay down his life for the people of South Africa and for the people all over the world. He made that statement about laying down his life for the freedom of people. So Mandela continues to be an inspiration to governments all over the world, to leaders, he walks in the footsteps of Gandhiji, Martin Luther King, and many other great leaders. Selfless leaders like Che Guevara who lay down their lives so that we can have a better world. When Mandela came to Delhi in 1990 to receive that award, the Bharat Ratna Award, he made a very telling statement. And he said to the people of India, you all gave to us Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. We in South Africa returned to you a Mahatma. And this was how 
he solidified and cemented the links between the two nations. Mandela saluted the people of India for their stance against apartheid and racism, and for India being the first country to raise the flag of freedom for people of South Africa. Yes, Mr. Logi. When they introduce sanctions against apartheid. So thank you for hosting a discussion about, so my task is to say thank you to everyone. Let me firstly thank uh, Judge Navanitham Pillay, who comes from my hometown of Durban, who has distinguished herself as an international jurist. Congratulations on receiving this first Award for Peace and Reconciliation, the International Mandela Award for Peace and Reconciliation. Well done, keep up the wonderful work that you're doing. To Dr. Gudrum uh, Kramer from the Austrian Center for Peace, thank you for the work that you do. You've been recognized and continue in the path that you are traveling in promoting peace and reconciliation all over the world. Our dear friend, former Prime Minister of Guyana, Dr. Moses Nagamutu. Thank you for your presentation. You've been linked with the people of the Congress movement in South Africa for a long time, and you in your own right, championed the freedom of people in your country and throughout the world. And we salute you for your selfless service to the people of Guyana and the world. Uh, to our Chief Minister of Pondicherry, Chief Minister Narayan Sami, always on our side, always helping. Yes, you can speak. Always there, even at previous, cannot express our heartfelt gratitude for being in non-governmental organizations in a quest for freedom and democracy and a truly just society. Our Minister Praveen Godan. I have to say and repeat this Praveen Godan, Mac Maraj, Ravi Pillay, myself, Navanidham Pillay, are people who fought for freedom and were prepared to lay down their lives so that South Africa could be free. Today, they serve in very important positions in government, continuing the work of activism that they did for the last 50 years, actively working for a just society, a peaceful, non-racial, democratic, non-sexist uh, South Africa, and the very same values that Mandela embraced so that it can inspire other countries. Today in the world, we see a lot of right-wing governments that are dividing their people, that are promoting hatred and discriminating on the grounds of language and religion and caste and, and all the isms. We want to say to them that we must live the legacy of Mandela, we must live the legacy of all the freedom fighters of the world. To our former Under Secretary, of the United Nations. Comrade, thank you. And your words, Mandela, and keep up the good work that you do on promoting climate change and a new world order. Being in parliament in your country, you continue to be the voice of the reasonable, the voice of the rational, and the voice of, of the progressive Democrats throughout the world. Uh, Justice Karnukaran from Seychelles, former Justice, um, Chief Justice, we thank you for your contribution and your recollections of your visit to Pretoria, South Africa, and to, uh, to Robben Island. And we wish you well and thank you for, for all that you have said. A member of parliament, Mr. Tiruchi, um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you visited Robben Island also and that you went to Mandela cell and you saw the limestone quarries where they worked because that continues to inspire people to strive for freedom and democracy. To Mr. N. Ram, um, 
Thank you. You are a journalist and you had the singular privilege of meeting Mandela. And please, that memory must remain etched in your heart and your memory forever, because these freedom fighters like Mandela come once in a lifetime. Uh, to Dr. Sita Raman, thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Input, your contribution, Parliament, uh, Mr. T.K. as Elan Govan, uh, the Member of Parliament from Australia. Thank you very much for your contribution also. Finally, to Dr. Sampath and the Madras Development Society. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the good work that you do as an NGO. Keep the flag of freedom flying. Keep the flag of democracy flying. Keep up the good work that you do. And to all of you who listened in, who participated in some way or the other, God bless you all and thank you very much. Mikanandri. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Logi Naidu. We had a wonderful meeting. Uh, in the, all proceedings available in the Facebook of uh, Dr. V.R.S. Sampat, as well as Madras Development Society YouTube. If you open YouTube, you will uh, see the whole speech of the, the more than three and a half hours. You can listen to all the speeches. We can post it every speech separately also. It's so very good. Newspaper and television media, all they can use this uh, and uh, propagate about this conference. Thank you, one and all. Uh, the, this is a Zoom meeting over. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.